My plan for that day had been simple, relaxing even. It was my first outing since the lockdown had eased, and I was nearly bursting at the seams to get out of my small apartment and back into the world. I had planned to take my regular weekend trip through one of these states and many parks, clearing my mind of the baggage accumulated over a week of working remotely for my phone bank, a job I hated, but I kept out of absolute necessity. That day now lives on in personal infamy, as the day in which the trajectory of my life was changed by the veil being lifted from over my eyes, being exposed to the true horrors that call our world their stomping grounds. It was Saturday, one of the two days allotted by the work week for me to actually try and enjoy my life. The goal was to go for my usual hike, taking the two and a half hour drive from my cramped Chicago apartment out to my favorite of these states, lesser known state parks, and disappear down my favorite of its all but unused hiking trails, as was customary, taking photos of whatever interesting wildlife or flora I saw along the way. My weekend escapades into some of the various forests of my state were always about escapism. There were the few moments that I could steal for myself and which I could escape the gray fog of blandness that seemed so pervasive in my life since college days, worsened by the ever suffocating realization that I was working a dead end job in a field that I hated, in a city I didn't love, in a life of pure stagnation that I was growing more and more dissatisfied of by camping or hiking and giving me a feeling of purpose my life seemed to lack. My chosen trail was the most daunting of them all, a hike stretching several miles through some of the more uneven parts of the terrain, leading across a small bridge over a creek, through some rather dense forest on rather uneven ground. Due to the difficulty of it, it was almost always empty, save for the odd occasional hiker, as dedicated as myself, or a park ranger roaming that little of a path existed amongst the ever-encroaching plant life, and even those were rare sights. When I had arrived that day, however, I was greeted at the opening of the path by a red tape, stretched between hand rolls on either side of the small wooden entrance to the trail. A small sign hung from the center of it, its red letters immediately catching my eye. Trail closed due to wildfire damages. Thank you for your patience. Park service. For a moment, I considered the warning. A quick glance around me revealed only a few straggling hikers, none of whom were paying me any mind, and no sign of any park rangers. I've gone off the path before. I can wade through that creek, no problem, I thought. A tingle of excitement buzzing through me at the prospect of a hike with an added element of stealth. I had always been something of a thrill seeker, an aspect of life I really got to indulge in, stuck in a cubicle most hours of my life, and I couldn't pass up the chance to do something that got my heart racing, even as small as this. A grin stretched across my face, and I quickly made my way under the tape and down the path before anyone could take notice. The path was almost unchanged from usual with the exception of an hour in as I approached the familiar clearing. A small man-made field of nothing maybe, 20 feet across surrounded by the oaks and pines. In it stood a massive white tower like a cabin on stilts, the fire lookout station. The path stretched directly through the clearing, and in view of any potential ranger on the lookout, who would surely turn me back. I crouched low, holding the straps of my camera bag close to my body to prevent it from shuffling against the leaves, venturing off the path for the first time, staying well within the tree line, as I slowly made my way around the clearing. Through the trees, I could sort of make out the ranger in the tower above, and her attention seemed to be directed the other way. I felt a small surge of relief at that, 
My hair stood on end in the excruciating silence. I doubt that I even took in a lungful of air until I was long past the clearing and back on, on the main path. Still, I kept my guard up. Based on what the notice had said, there had been a fire in the area recently, and I could imagine there may be an increase of rangers on foot in the area to identify the cause. It was strange to me, though, that I had heard nothing at all about such an event, given how much I frequented the park, and I gathered that it must have been recent. I reached the bridge soon after, or its remnants anyway, just a few acres past the tower, bearing the first visual evidence of any forest fire I'd seen since I'd entered. Charred remnants of the planks that had once been a bridge extended out from the earth in jagged pieces from both sides of the creek's bank. A few heavier chunks in no better shape caught on stones in the rushing water below. The fire had clearly ravaged the thing, leaving little trace of it, and I could understand why this could be seen as a potential hazard. A sudden inkling of curiosity raised a question as I looked at the area around the former bridge. None of the nearby trees seemed to bear any signs of a fire. No charring or missing leaves, nothing. I wondered what kind of wildfire this was and how it had seemingly leaped past half of them directly to the bridge, when perhaps a traveling spark. The explanations felt wanting, but the thought was a vague curiosity in itself, and not nearly enough to stop my hike. If anything, it was starting to feel something like an adventure, which is exactly what I had sort of wanted from these things. My smile returned as I began removing my boots and hiking socks, rolling up my pant legs as I stepped into the creek below. The water was colder than I had anticipated, sending an icy jolt through me as soon as I made contact. It reached just above my knees, and the current was stronger than I had expected, nearly making me lose balance, and almost plunged my back into the water. A sigh of relief escaped my lips as I maintained my footing, just barely, and crossed the stream with care, easing over these slick rocks beneath my feet. I put everything back on and continued the hike. At some point, removing my camera from the bag and snapping pictures of the places where the afternoon sun broke through the canopy. I had been walking for a little over an hour when I caught sight of what I realized was the first animal that I had seen since I had arrived. A deer, a buck specifically, with a crown of white horns that stretched magnificently. I could almost see the shot lined up in my head. I fumbled with the strap of the bag, bringing it around to my chest as I took out my camera and lined up the shot, peering into the viewfinder. Darkness. Ah, the freaking lens cap, you idiot. I scoffed before I could realize it. The animal and I both looked up at each other in that instant. Please don't. It was off before I could even finish the thought, darting deeper into the brush, down a decline in the uneven earth. I fouled as best as I could, walking an impossible tightrope between staying close enough to keep it in sight and staying somewhat quiet, often failing at both. It settled down several yards ahead for a moment, taking a moment to sniff the air, before disappearing down a steep decline in the hilly surface, behind a mass of bushes, salted with an odd dust. I took the moment to catch my breath, placing my hands on my knees to keep myself up as I huffed deep breaths. Standing still for the first time since I had gotten past the remnants of the bridge, I could see the signs of the fire that had closed the path. The ground was layered in a thin film of gray ash, like a light snowfall, that covered everything in a light dusting. Beneath it, the forest floor was covered in leaves, all burnt to various degree, some in unrecognizable black crisp, others just singed at the edges all crumbling with contact. And there was something else. I squinted, 
confusion and a disgusted interest blooming in some synapses of my brain as I noticed it. It was a wet, shiny film covering parts of the ground, ash and burnt leaves sticking to it. I had almost missed it. The strange layer of whatever it was blending in with the charred leaves, black ash and making its color murky. Its consistency was snot-like and I shuddered, the mental comparison making me itch with revulsion, yet peeking an almost childlike sort of curiosity. Scanning the ground for a big twig, I noticed several more piles of the stuff, a few spots of the goo not yet dyed by the surrounding ash, being blown across the floor by each passing breeze. They were almost opaque, with the slightest red tint. A sudden yowl, animalistic and pained, rang out from the brush ahead, making my stomach drop, as if it were on a roller coaster. My heart seized with an immediate grip of panic, shock rippling through me in uncomfortable waves. As the final echoes of the cry rang out, a suffocating silence fell. The air grew thick with a fog of unease, that spine-tingling cry ringing in my ears. I had been hunting once and only once as a kid. My father had shot a deer, but it was moving so he hadn't landed a killing blow. The bullet dug into its hind leg, and it fell that it snapped the thing. And that poor animal, I swear it screamed. Not just to bray like I had heard animals do when they were upset or scared, but screamed the type of scream of something in true agony. Dad had quickly put it out of its misery, but that scream, I'll never forget it. And this was too similar to that. Strands of creeping dread started to drape themselves over me like a tattered cloak, as these sounds brought me back to that moment. Another cry stirred me from my memory, my thoughts coming somewhat frantically. The notice had warned of downed trees and other hazards, and perhaps the animal had fallen victim to one of the above. My mind conjured an image of the beautiful thing, its leg partially impaled on some jutting piece of broken wood as it cried desperately for help that wouldn't come. Perhaps my thinking was clouded by an old trauma, logic failing me at the moment, but I felt an unshakable urge to help the creature. How I would be able to help a 200 pound plus creature deep on a closed trail I wasn't meant to be on, I hadn't yet determined. But emotion drove my actions. I ran my mind across a small list of predators one might encounter in an Illinois forest, and though none seemed likely, I wasn't going to take a chance. I rifled through the camera back for a few tense moments until I found what I was looking for. In the neighboring pocket to the one holding my emergency flare gun, with two flares tucked in alongside it, was a cheap revolver. I had bought it a few years before after a scary run-in with a mountain lion in another park, and I carried it for the sole purpose of scaring off something big. I felt a modicum of comfort as I gripped the handle. Adjusting my pants, I stuck it firmly between my waistband, confident that in the off chance a ranger or anyone else was this far out, to quell fears of concealed carry violations. I tried to swallow the lump of anxiety in my throat, stealing myself as I slid down the slight decline where the animal had disappeared through the tree line of some sort of a mass of old oaks. So, this is where it started. As I stepped through, it was as though I had stepped into another world, entering a clearing that bore every potential scar of a wildfire. It was one of ash and waste, the ground littered with the few burned stumps of the trees that had once stood, sooty ash traveling on the breeze, sticking to the sweat on my brow. Save for the few standing twists of bark jarred a pale white, and the skeletal shapes of trees barren of their leaves and branches, the last stubborn remnants of some of the regal oaks that had once stood there, it appeared all but desolate until I saw it. At the dead center of this surreal little wasteland hidden with the trees, 
stood the only tree that seemed relatively unharmed, somehow by the destruction that had been wrought. Something vague and ominous tangled in me at the sight of it, dwarfed by the overwhelming curiosity the unusual thing arose. It stood, all but touched by the blaze that had laid waste to the forest around it. From where I stood, it looked almost like an unusually large birch tree, its bark a pale with what looked like dark knots along its surface, a shock of brilliant red leaves extending from the top of it. As I drew closer, my eyes roaming its shape I saw, peeking from behind at the bottom of its trunk, two hoofed back legs. The embers of an ease were fanned, blazing a bit hotter, as I realized I had found what I was looking for. The deer, that regal thing I intended to capture in all its glory, it was almost surely dead, if not asleep, and I very much doubted that by its stillness, laying with its upper half concealed behind the wide trunk of the odd tree, and the way that its legs splayed out unnaturally. I considered turning back, the thought weighing heavier on my mind with the growing unease. When else am I going to see something like this? This is why you came here, to be out of your comfort zone. The thought was almost a realization, but I knew that it was true. There was no way that I was turning back yet. Curiosity burned every bit as bright as my discomfort, perhaps brighter as I grew nearer, and saw the odd shuffle of the strange tree leaves. The scene was almost beautiful in a morbid way. The deer lay partially concealed behind the soot-layered white tree in a land of waste, as ash carried on the breeze like snow. The tree itself, I realized, was just as haunting in its own regard, and against my better judgment, I approached. Alone it stood at the center of the clearing, burned into the forest like a scar. Amongst nothing but ash and gnarled remains of others it stood, the longer that I looked at it, the more I could feel an animal dread climb at the recesses of my mind, which I dismissed as a natural instinct of being in an area following such ruin. As I approached, any semblance of beauty faded as it was brought into resolve. I'm no arborist or whatever, and I never claim to be some expert in plants, but I've seen my fair share of trees and could identify near any native to the area. And this thing was different. It looked vaguely like an oak. Now that I was within a yard or two of it, yet its bark seemed strange, almost dead somehow. It bloated out as though whatever grew inside wouldn't fit the bark for much longer, distending outwards at unusual angles. Its color was more gray than the usual tone of brown and little flecks of burnt wood flaked and peeled off, all over it leaving something resembling a ring of ash at its base. The knots bulging out from it at points were all spherical in shape, with deep gouges down the center of them. It made my skin crawl with an insectoid sensation, the urge to see each of them off raising the hair along my back, until I got a closer look at the top of the thing. Jesus Christ. I breathed as I took a closer look at the tree's strange foliage. The leaves, if I could even call them that, were unlike any I had ever seen. There were less leaves by any recognizable metric, and more like clear sacks of reddish liquid, each in a teardrop shape that, at a distance, made them appear to be red leaves. As I drew closer, I couldn't tell what they were. They pulsated barely, but it was noticeable the longer that I looked. They filled and emptied with each quiver, cycling more of that liquid through with each pump. It was like thousands of little, malformed hearts lining the branches of the thing, pumping in unison. My skin crawled and contracted with primal disgust, as though insects were crawling the surface, everything about the unnatural sight making me sick. I need to get a picture, I thought, 
the deer almost gone from my mind at this point. There was something so strange, so alien and impossible about what I was seeing, that before I realized what I was doing, I had slung my camera over my shoulder and reached out, the tip of my index finger touching one of the pulsating leaves. The pace of its pulse quickened to a frantic point, the red ooze contained within its membrous walls leaking through unseen pores and onto my hand. Oh, gross, I cried, yanking my hand away. A sickly sweet scent wafted forth me as though the contact had caused it. An unappealing sensation when blended with the sheer disgust I felt of the substance. My stomach turned with the palpable threat of vomit in response. It was warm and thick, like coagulated blood, and it started to burn increasingly the longer that it sat. I wiped my hand against my pant leg vigorously, managing to get most of the red liquid off, though it left a stain on my palm. My mind drew a blank for anything even vaguely similar. From some murky depths of my consciousness, something cried for me to get as far away as I could from the thing, an inexplicable dread rising in me at the sight of the thing. Yet even more pronounced was the curiosity I felt surging and the enticement of the prospect that I had discovered as something unheard of, outweighing the surreality of the situation. This tree was utterly unlike any plant that I had ever seen, seeming to possess features that I had only known to exist in animals, and my mind began to run wild with images of my name in journals and massive paydays for the first photographic evidence of an unknown type of life and leaving behind the cubicle life. As if by the flip of a switch as I stood there, I recalled the very reason I had entered the clearing. The deer. I had wanted to get a good look at it, a morbid curiosity as to why it seemed to just drop dead pushing me forward. I rounded the tree, the legs coming more and more into view from around the other side as I did. The bark seemed to radiate with an odd heat from somewhere within, reminiscent of the warm emitted from another person's body when you stand too close. Nausea twisted my stomach into knots and my mouth went dry. The soles of my brown hiking boot were stained to dark red amongst the clinging dirt. A swell of panic began to arise, my mind beginning to reel up possibility after possibility for why or how. It could have ended up like that in so little time. Knowing that no animal that was native to this part of the country was possible of that sort of destruction. I rounded the tree, dueling confusion and dread both blooming in me as I realized I had been wrong, or half wrong at least. The deer hadn't simply been laying behind the tree, not all of it at least. It was certainly dead. Though what lay before me in a dark pool of a scarlet blood was only the lower half of its body. Anything above the center of its chest was torn away. I kept my head docked, doing what I could to avoid my head at touching one of those sticky leaves as I stared at it. Curiosity and the strange surreality of the situation freezing me in place, my mind beginning to flood with questions, chief among them being... Or where was the second half of the deer? My mind reeled for an answer. I had only seen it mere minutes ago into my understanding. Even a mountain lion couldn't do so much damage in so little time, let alone disappear without a trace. I was beginning to question why I had ventured this far. The lighthearted hopes of an adventure from earlier, all but gone with the realization that I may have knowingly brought myself near whatever predator was capable of this. The stark silence in the clearing began to feel dark and foreboding, when the thoughts were scattered in an instant, by the feeling of something warm and wet hitting the center of my forehead. A shock rippled off from the point of contact and I stumbled back wiping it away. Disgust took blossomed out into waves, my stomach twisting at the sight of the red streak end along my hand. For a moment, I brought my hand close to my face reluctantly, expecting, almost hoping for the sweet scent of that strange sap from the leaves. 
I pulled back immediately once I knew there was none. It was blood. The consistency was unmistakable. I rubbed away vigorously at my forehead with the bottom of the shirt, staining it the same color. My eyes roaming up the tree in an automatic response. The blur of motion from something large and dark falling quickly from above, along with the wet rustle of those strange leaves spurred me into motion before I could process it. Crab, I cried, leaning back in time to narrowly avoid being crushed beneath it. The impact of whatever it was kicked a cloud of ash up in its wake, billowing in all directions, and I could feel an irritating itch in my throat as I breathed it in descending into a brief coughing fit. As the ash cleared from the air, it revealed what had almost crushed me, falling apparently somewhere out of the canopy of this unnerving tree was revealed. The air felt cold, colder than before, and a sense of horror bred only by a series of inexplicable events that gripped my heart, and an icy vice of panic as I looked up at the upper half of the deer, my mind still reeling as its sudden appearance. Large puncture wounds aligned its body as though something massive had been chewing on it. Tattered flecks of muscle and tissue hanging from the point at which it had clearly been ripped in half. My mind reeled, conjuring frightful images of the animal capable of doing this. It was time to go, I realized. There was something large and predatory nearby, and I didn't want to meet it. I turned to leave, giving a parting look at that impossible tree, its pale, strange bark, and those pulsating cell-like leaves, as I climbed the little small incline out of the ashen clearing. I had begun to walk back, but with every step, the nagging instinct to return for just a moment grew. It was as if my camera burned hot in my hand, begging me to go back and take just one photo of that thing. Ah, I forgot the picture. I came all this way for nothing at this point, I thought. And you'll never see anything like this again, probably. Just one picture. My pace slowed and eventually, with a sigh, I came to a stop. Freaking idiot, I muttered. Just one picture from a distance and then I'm out. I repeated it under my breath as if it were a mantra. My eyes on my camera as I proceeded back towards the edge of the area, scarred by the apparent fire, getting my settings in order. I arrived at the precipice of the little drop-in, and giving my camera a final once-over to ensure the process was quick and smooth, I slid down into the clearing. I landed with the firm crunch of dead or dying leaves under my feet, and, closing my other eye, lined up the eerie tree in my viewfinder. Through the haunting shapes making up the forest, charred remnants surrounding it, seeing it for the first time since I had turned back. Crunch. An animalistic crunch rang out. My heart went into freefall. The clearing echoed with a stomach-churning series of sounds like the sloppy chewing of a massive animal making my blood run cold. Dread washed over me like a waterfall as I saw through my camera something I couldn't understand. Somehow both halves of the deer hung several feet from the ground, tangled in the pale limbs of the tree, which seemed to have wrapped one or more of their legs in a vice grip, as if it had grown around them. At first it appeared that the tree was covered in insects, or small worms lashing out at the corpse until... I realized what I was seeing, and it was somehow worse. The feeling quickly faded into a sense of a stomach-twisting horror, the likes of which I had never known before, at the utter alien impossibility of what I was looking at. Those leaves, I don't even know if I can call them that, they were like parasites, small rope-like growths shooting in and out of them, latching onto the animal's remains going from pale to red as they filled with its blood. I watched, awash in a paralyzing blend of odd horror and disgust, as they thrashed at and fought with one another in their attempts to feed, extensions gliding blindly into the corpse. They would sometimes entangle each other by accident in the frenzy, leading to a thrashing conflict ending only when one seemed to tear the other from its leave.
which would grow another and continue the horrific feeding. It was frantic, unearthly, and I could feel my sanity shift under the weight of it all. Suddenly, as though receiving some collective instruction, the leaves curled away, withdrawing their strange grows. In that same instance, the branch of the tree began to coil and tighten, resembling less the appendage of any sort of tree and more the torso of a snake or some ungodly tentacle. The branch of the tree raised, with a slow creak that filled the air as its bark tilted back. Those reaching leaves lowered close to the ground. That hole which I had rightfully assumed the deer had been impaled in, though I had not anticipated how, opened wider. And I understood immediately what it was as it squeezed remnants of blood and viscera from the poor beast's lower half, like a child would a juice box. It lowered the rest of the animal into its mouth, gnashing violently on its bony lower half. The crunching continued, the sound horrid and muffled from within the bark of whatever the heck this thing was, and its branch-like limbs lowered to its sides, the bark rippling and folding with motion like the head of a lizard as it devoured its mouthful. Fear sent a spasm through my body. I tensed, my fingers twitched. Beep. Click. My camera gives off its electronic chime, followed by the click of the lens as it takes a photo. Searing panic grips my heart and device until it feels as though I may pass out. Everything in me yearned to run, to get as far from whatever impossibility I was seeing. My thoughts sporadic and non-linear under the sheer amount of panic that I felt. But for a few moments, my body remained frozen terror robbing me of my faculties. For several seconds, there was nothing. The noisy chewing from the thing in the center of the clearing had stopping abruptly. But the whisper of the breeze among the surrounding leaves and the echoed click of the camera. The tension in the air was suffocating, and I stepped back against the mound of earth at my back. The level and energy palpable in waves from the monstrous thing standing just a few yards ahead of me. I watched through the lens, afraid to even move my hand from my face. Every second of stillness watered both hope and a swelling horror in opposition. The groan of creaking wood carried through these silent woods with ominous effect. The stir of the thing's leaves were the first sign of its movement. The entire thing moved, its massive form turning in place. I immediately understood why there had been such odd details on the thing, and the strange sense of pareidolia I felt while looking at it that I couldn't quite pinpoint. I could see now that several of these strange knots and lines throughout had simply been shot, concealing behind them the true nature of whatever was inside of the bark. The lines that had seemed almost carved into the warped wood revealed rows of small, jagged teeth like the jaws of a lamprey. The knots in the bark were apparently eyelids, dozens of them, sprouting forth all over the strange creature. Beneath them sat dozens of little piercing yellow eyes like those of a snake, and all of them were directed at me. A cold dagger of dread seared through me. Crap. The thought summed up all I felt succinctly. My thoughts instantly awash a sort of dread that I had never known and a familiar irritation at my error, this time with surely dire consequences. It reared back, the hole that could have only been its mouth stretching open to give a momentary glimpse at something dark and wet looking beneath, before another mouth opened, this one lined with rows of small teeth that weren't made of wood. A sound like the wail of an infant but from something much larger, unhinged and raw with emotion, tinged with a fury that made my skin crawl, rang from behind me, echoing off of the surrounding trees, almost making me feel surrounded. The horror rolled through me in tidal waves, adrenaline soon following, sending a warm shock through my system, kicking my heart into a painful rhythm. I turned, the hairs in the back of my neck rising as I put the thing behind me, and scurried up the little earth mountain out of the clearing, 
rising to my feet with more effort than I would have liked as I started to run back the way that I had come. The sound of rushing wind rang out from behind me like some miniature hurricane moved in my wake, and as I chanced the glass before the clearing disappeared behind the foliage, I saw it stretch itself along the ground and began slithering forward with all the speed and ferocity of a charging animal, slithering with surprising agility between the charred remnants of forest dotting the impromptu clearing. I ran, jumping over gulches and ducking beneath the limbs of trees as I fled down the unkempt path. The camera in its bag buckled against my back, slung over opposite shoulders, and I worried for a moment that the strap wouldn't hold before immediately dismissing the thought of how stupid it was given present circumstances. With every step my legs threatened to collapse from beneath me, fearing exhaustion spreading like an infection, making my body feel heavy and unresponsive. The rush of blood roared in my ears and my head throbbed as I watched the forest floor ahead of me, desperate not to stumble over anything knowing a simple trap was the difference between life and a cliché horror movie death. I stuck to the path as best as I could, veering off at points in order to put trees between the slithering monstrosity and myself. It cried out again, close enough behind that I could feel the vibration of it in my bones. My heart plummeted, the sheer horror motivating a momentary burst of speed. The forest echoed with the cracking and barking breaking wood from the creature itself, and all that it trampled in its wake, the leaves on a surrounding trees shaking with its approach. I made the split-second decision to chance another glance behind me. A flood of adrenaline spurred my existential dread, and it spurred me forth as I saw it. That thing... It was slithering amongst the treetops, making them creak under its weight as the trunk of its body wrapped around those of the massive oaks as it stretched from tree to tree. Its branches were merely a grasping mass of limbs, almost tentacles it seemed, sheathed in wood. It moved with an impossible speed and fluidity for something of its size. The leaves that hung to its limbs ejected their thin vestiges furiously creating an almost pulse-like effect. It was moving too fast. There was no way that I was going to be able to outrun it. The exit from the trail was 10, 15 minutes away at least, and the thing was closing the distance between us rapidly. The cacophony behind me growing closer by the second, regardless of my own speed. I'm going to die. This isn't possible, and I'm going to die too. I couldn't even finish the thought. Not for the horror of the realization, but the simple fact that I hadn't had any clue what I was running from. And then I heard it. The faint trickle of running water was audible from ahead, even amongst the chaos. I felt a sudden rush of something close to hope, as the charred remnants of the bridge came into view soon after. Something in me sparked at the first sight of something familiar, the bridge almost feeling like a landmark to spur me forth. Desperation surged through the passageways of my brain as an idea occurred. Before I could consider what I was doing, I drew the revolver from my waist and lined a shot as best as I could while still running. Panic coiled around my heart with every step and my pace slowed as I tried to take in a breath and steady myself. I fired. I was a decent shot, nothing spectacular, but I could get a nice grouping on a target a few times I was able to get down to the range and practice. But I had never once considered actually shooting a moving target. Six thunderous bangs exploded out from the mouth of the gun as I cocked the hammer and pulled the trigger as quickly as I could, interspersed by two wet pops. Without the usual luxury of earmuffs worn at a range, my ears filled with a tinnitus-like ring. A dagger-like pain exploded in my wrist. Several of the shots hit nothing but air, as expected, disappearing through the canopy above into the sky. Yet by some stroke of uncharacteristic luck, the third and sixth shots made contact. There is the sound of cracking wood, followed by wet pops as the metal projectiles ripped through the beast splintering its makeshift wooden exoskeleton. Its tentacle limbs went limp momentarily, 
surprise, somehow apparent even, in its utterly unfamiliar features. The distraction enough to make it lose its balance among the treetops it had been darting between. It was sent to plummeting nearly 30 or 40 feet from the canopy, hitting the ground with a blood-curdling shriek. Projectiles of twigs, rocks, and other forests at Detritus flew out in all directions. The sound of its massive form meeting the earth, louder than the shots had been. The cursory thought that perhaps the shot from my little revolver might have dealt the horror a lethal blow was a foolish. But its reaction at least confirmed to me that I could hurt the horrid thing which was a source of light amongst the seeming darkness of my predicament. It started twitching and thrashing in a way that was reminiscent of an insect writhing under the effects of some poison. As though the landing had done some neurological damage, the movement made even more awful by its form. Eventually, it ceased the stomach turning, twisting, and nodding of its strange form, worm-like in a way that made my skin crawl, settling into a heavy, breathing mass of wood and whatever the sleek black thing that lied beneath its bark was, as it regained its composure. It screeched out with the sound, reminiscent of a car crash, the groan of metal against metal forced by traumatic force into impossible shapes. It was inconceivable from the vocal cords of any being that I could think of yet. Somehow, it sounded tinged with an obvious pain. I was sure that it must have echoed for miles. I felt my eardrum shake, my vision doing the very same. I had injured it, and I was sure of that. The realization that I was even capable of such a thing gave me a brief ray of hope. Scorched almost as soon as it occurred to me that I had expended what little ammunition I had kept on me. The gun was always meant to be a last ditch effort for scaring off an animal, and never something that I ever intended to use outside of a range. So the idea of carrying a load of ammunition besides what I kept chambered it had seemed unnecessary. Now, I wanted to hit myself for my laziness, though I knew such a thing as this could never have been anticipated. Still, my two shots would clearly not be enough to stop the coiling mass of wood, as evident by the thrash of movement as it tried to bring itself to its feet, struggling visibly with the injury. It let out another, otherworldly cry tinged with a universally understood emotion. Rage. The gun was now empty, and I was again defenseless, though the pressure of terror and unparalleled still weighed on me. I had heard it, and the fact had offered me a sort of fuel to push me forward. The fire watchtower. It was as though a switch had been flipped, my mind recalling the tower which I had gone through great effort to avoid, and the ranger that it housed. It was certain the commotion of the beast's pursuit must have been audible from that distance, and I prayed that if I could get close enough, I could call for help. I knew that the signal would be even spotty then, and doubted that I would have time to place a phone call, but surely the ranger in the watchtower would hear the chaos. What a singular park ranger might be able to do against this titan I wasn't sure, but in the heat of the moment it felt like a light at the end of the tunnel. The beast was still shaken, but regaining its strength more by the second, I could see the area that my shot had hit, and though I wasn't sure what to expect, I was still surprised at the result. The wood covering its body for almost a foot around the point of impact had been shattered, like a broken exoskeleton, exposing something black and slimy underneath, spilling out of the opening. A wound in the surface of the thing within the hollow shell of bark bubbled with a dark red liquid. Several of the eyes aligning its bark all turned in me, a hazy fury present even in their alien gaze. No more time to think. I ran not bothering to remove my boots this time as I trudged across the icy creek, clawing myself onto the opposing bank and running towards the tower. Water sloshed in my shoes and added extra weight to my clothes, which were soaked through my navel down. The crashing of movement from behind I started again, as though a train were somehow moving through the center of the forest. It was up again, though I had heard it more than I had thought it seemed. Its movements appeared limited, 
And that's a stretch of the word to the ground now. Whatever damage I had dealt enough to make the pulling its weight through the air infeasible. It now slithered on the ground as I had first seen in the clearing, pushing itself through the earth as though the dirt were liquid. It was slower now, but not by much, charging along the forest floor like some massive snake, only slowing down to stretch itself across the creek. I ran like I never had before. Every muscle burned and ached. My lungs stung with each breath, and the thud of my heartbeat felt life-threatening. The threat that I was going to vomit lingered, my body undergoing a level of physical exertion I wasn't prepared for. I couldn't though. Even a momentary break of pace would likely mean a violent end. I wasn't going to stop, driven forward by my most primal of survival instincts. The clearing had to be only a few minutes away if my memory had served. An idea sparked the synapses of my brain. Without another thought, I pulled the revolver again, letting off the final three shots in a flurry at the general direction of the creature. I could hear its movement shift, and with a momentary look back saw it break its straight path towards me, veering off into the trees in a blur as the bullets sank into the bark of trees or exploded into the dirt where it had been. Good enough. It was after me, but it appeared to be circling through the trees, rather than barreling down the path like a train, making its approach less of a straight shot. I had bought some time. Trying to keep my pace, I reached into the camera bag, flying widely around my chest, pulling the flare gun out. I struggled as I ran to load the cartridge into it, my hands unsteady. But the sound of falling trees as the thing grew closer served to motivate me as I eventually got it in. For a split second, I worried about whether a flare could start another fire, having already seen the damage it could wreak on this forest, and that might be for the best. I raised the gun to the air and let off a shot. There was a pop, not nearly as loud as the revolvers and a hiss that grew ever distant as the glowing projectile took to the sky. That thing, it shrieked but the sound was a different now, almost afraid, and I heard it come to a crashing halt. I considered looking back but instantly thought better of it, unwilling to squander this opportunity to put distance between us. The path ahead was growing clearer, the signs of human intervention and upkeep growing more apparent. Familiarity bloomed in me, with it the greatest hope that I had felt since the horrific ordeal had begun. I was close. The path ahead began to curve and I knew that in just a few turns I was going to see the clearing. And then I heard it again. The booming roar of earth being displaced by something massive as it dozed forth, closing in fast. Too fast. No, no, God, no, I begged. My legs searing from the heat of pain and exertion. I ran straight through the trees, veering off of the twisting path for fear of losing precious seconds. Branches clawing and whipping deep cuts into my face as I did, my breathing loud and jagged. I screamed, with what breath I could muster, calling for help knowing that I had to be within hearing distance of anyone at the tower, who would surely have seen my flare. I could see it, emerging through a break in the trees ahead of the center of the clearing, which seemed to glow with sunlight and salvation against the rumble of certain doom behind me. Hurry up, I can't help you until you're out of there. I heard the woman's voice before I saw her, but her words were all I needed to push forward. He radiated off of the massive form, growing warmer along the back of my neck as it drew closer, the hairs on my neck rising as the cloying flagella of its would-be leaves all thrashed forward, occasionally reaching far enough to sink into my neck with a sharp sensation. I slapped at them frantically my hands coming away covered in my own blood in that mucusy fluid. The opening in the trees grew when the tower quickly came into view, and I could soon see who it was that had spoken out. She wore the usual polyester short, beige button-up, and a wide brim hat usual for a park ranger, though even in my frantic state I could see the glaring peculiarities. For one, she held something large in both of her hands, a rifle I realized as raising its massive barrel as I approached until it was pointing right at me. No, not a rifle, I realized. A flamethrower, 
I was almost out, just about to reach where the forest and clearing meet, when something thrashed against my back with incredible force. One of the bees, wood sheathed tentacles I imagine now looking back, sending me diving face first into the ground. My head sang with impact and the frantic shouts of the ranger faded into garbled background noise as I tried to gather myself, turning to face it as it closed the remaining distance. The closest of its grasping limbs snaked across the dirt of the forest floor and quickly slid up my shoe and onto my leg, attempting to wrap itself around my ankle. The bark dug into the leg of my pants and I could feel something like a muscle starting to tighten painfully beneath it. No. It was my mind's singular panic-driven declaration. A refusal of the death I was surely about to be pulled to. I dove forward with all the strength I could muster from the ground. My right leg being extended out by the creature as it pulled. Launching all of my weight into the clearing. I managed to tear from its wanting grip the jagged bark, ripping the leg of my jean and leaving deep scratches in my skin in the process, but my heart soared in the instant I felt my leg come free. I threw myself forward into a stumbling run, managing to collapse and roll in heap at the woman's feet. Kill it! I hardly recognized the belligerent panic in my voice as I half crawled, half stumbled into a run making a mad dash to the tower which had come to represent safety in my mind only stopping once I was halfway through the clearing and realized that I hadn't heard the creature charging forth. The woman stood at the edge of the clearing, a weapon raised to the creature which made it stand at the very edge of the forest, as though somehow the clearing were a boundary. It rose to its full height and I felt my mind waned under its impossible form. It stretched almost thirty feet, the bark that had concealed it cracking profusely and revealing what was beneath. It looked vaguely slug-like, large and black, shining with a coat of some fluid. Its body was covered in bulging eyelids that concealed those piercing yellow eyes, long, eerily human mouths full of hundreds of sharp teeth. All from its upper middle section and above stretched along dark tentacles, swaying eerily like branches in a breeze. Those pulsing leaves, now more like cells in my eyes, connected to the respective branch by thick blue veins. Yet somehow that thing, bred straight from a nightmare, was kept at bay. He and the short woman appeared to be locked in a battle of wills, and neither breaking the other's gaze. I don't know how you survived the first burning. God forbid you monsters are still breathing somehow. But you know what's gotta happen next, bud. She spoke to it like she was chastising a dog that had bitten someone disappointment and genuine sadness in her voice. The creature hissed at her with every one of its mouths, those beady yellow eyes growing into a look of pure hate. Despite all I had seen that day, I still found myself taken aback. The thing seemed to understand her, and the way she spoke, as if somehow familiar with the thing, a pan they already armed to deal with it. My head spun, what sort of park ranger was this? I'm sorry about the others, your parents maybe, not really sure if you reproduce, but you guys can't go around eating all the animals and patrons of the park. Sorry kiddo. She pulled the trigger of the device and with a click, the beast recoiled with another hiss and a shudder of anger. For several seconds, there was nothing but the fading echo of its cry and the breeze rolling over the field. Another click, and then another. Nothing. No, no, not now. The woman began cursing and muttering frantically, backing away slowly as she looked between the weapon and the creature mere feet away from her. I could see the confidence waver even in her posture, and the cold knot of dread in me swelled, this time not for myself. That thing for the first time I had seen it did something familiar, human even all the more horrific given its nightmarish visage. It smiled, a crew, joyless smile, with every one of those razor-filled mouths curling up. She ran, letting the weapon fall to the ground as she turned and sprinted towards me, yelling something that I could hardly make out through the pounding in my ears. Go, run, she cried, motioning angrily for me to flee. It was on her in seconds, the beast almost tackling her as it caught her in a tangle of its limbs, 
wrapping two of them around her leg. I could see the things covering the branches in a veritable feeding frenzy, their protrusions snapping in and out as they filled with little streams of blood, attaching anywhere there is exposed skin. She screamed, doing her best to slap them from her face, unable to reach her legs as the creature drew her near. It rose to its feet, causing the ranger to hang upside down by her legs, alternating between fighting at the thousands of little things leeching at her face and trying to pry the vice grip of the branches around her ankles. I'm going to watch this woman die. She likely saved my life and is about to die for it. It was harrowing, almost worse than the fear that I had felt for my own life. A strange a sort of guilt mixed in as though I had exchanged her life for mine. I remembered the deer, the way I had found the thing completely torn like some stuffed animal, and for a moment I pictured the ranger in its place. My blood went cold at that. A loud crack made me jump as the thing slammed one of its massive limbs into the ranger, who threw up her arms in what little defense it offered. The creature crowded in rage and triumphed, bringing one of its bellowy mouths within inches of her face, before repeating the act delivering several more forceful blows. It was toying with her like I had seen my cat do with the odd mouse unlucky enough to wander inside. Several of its mouths spread into a smile that made my skin prickle. I racked my mind for something, anything that I could do to prevent what I knew was coming. Anything that I had done to her to disturb this thing before, I remembered. The woman hung there, dazed for a moment before spitting a mouthful of blood and saliva at the nearest of its eyes. It hissed, its hackle somehow raising, rearing back and lifting her above the largest of its maws. Those jagged spikes of wood still bore the remnants of its prior kill as it held her over oblivion. It was like finding a diamond in the rough, the memory playing almost like a flashback. I grabbed the flag gun from my camera bag, loading the final flare into the chamber. You little son of a... She muttered, but it roared in response, lowering her into its mouth when... Pop. The sound of the flare gun caught its attention in an instant, its body and every one of its eyes turning in my direction, mouths shutting an automatic response. It flung the woman to the ground with so much force that she bounced, but still, she managed to half crawl. Half roll away as my final flare whistled through the air. Its path curved and lulled us slightly in the breeze but stayed true to course. The creature yelped, something that I had not yet heard from it. A sound of fear and surprise. It had been distracted. Its strange fury and wrath directed at the ranger, making it all but forget about me and occupying its senses. It lurched to the side moving its massive body with incredible speed as it managed to mostly avoid contact, the flare soaring into its alien canopy. The minor contact was apparently enough. A ringing hiss like air rushing out of a balloon filled the clearing. Once and then twice, and then a hundred times over I saw the gelatinous sacks beginning to swell with bubbling liquid and gas that glowed through some strange reaction. Flames darted hungrily between the blobs which expanded rapidly, glowing brighter by the second as the reaction traveling with them. Its eyes darted in all directions between the spreading fire and me, fear and hatred glowing bright despite the unfamiliarity of its appearance. It looked as though it wanted to charge at me, kneeling forward as if to do so, when the first of a series of explosive pops sounded from its canopy. One of these swollen masses had burst, releasing a boiling spray of the fluid from inside all around it. Some searing drops landed on neighboring leaves, settling them into an explosive reaction repeating the process. The flames caught the liquid and burned white hot, following the trails of bloody fluid running down the monster's bark to spread along the sides of its body. Glowing cracks spread through the dead bark of the tree, falling away to reveal the thing beneath. It was massive, and I couldn't understand how it had fit in the bark to begin with. It appeared to be a giant slug or something similar, with slimy black tentacles, 
many of which were now sizzling and burning with the blaze, thrashing wildly at what might have been at the top or bottom of it. Throughout them were those swelling blobs, connected by deep purple veins that pulse as though with a heartbeat. The yellow eyes light in its black body burned with unreadable emotion as it tried to fight the flame spreading quickly along its body. What was left of its wooden exoskeleton was completely engulfed and it seemed the mucusy liquid it was covered in beneath was flammable, as the contents of its leaves, the fire rolling along its skin with ease. The cries of protest and fury grew airy and weak, eventually dying into faint hisses as the thing started to wither and dry under the spread of the inferno. I ducked away, feeling several flecks of the boiling liquid from those sacks hit my face as several more pop with a resounding finality, and the monster ceased its movement, falling into a rapidly emoliating heap. It took several moments before I was willing to move, my mind unable to accept the horror was over, despite seeing it burn before me, after expecting the monster to lurch forward with a roar at any moment, but it didn't. The only sounds coming from the beast were the hisses and pops of escaping gases from the dying blaze of its utterly charred form, which seemed to shrink until it was merely a few glowing embers in a slimy puddle. I approached the ranger, who was already sitting herself up as she observed the aftermath. She winced slightly as she rose, her arms swelling from what was likely a broken bone, rushing to her side as she fell back into a sitting position. I went to help her up but was waved off as she leaned back on her good arm, taking in deep breaths. It'll take a second to catch my breath. I'll have to call this in and wait for backup anyways, which will be a while. She took a deep breath, wincing. Definitely broke a rib or three, she muttered. I'm Savannah, you can call me Sav. She raised her bad hand to shake and then, observing it rapidly swelling, thought better of it. Hey, thanks for the help. I was impressively quick thinking under pressure. My mind was overrun with a hundred questions all piling up to be asked at once. What was that? I asked the most obvious of the questions. And why did you have a flamethrower? Well, I obviously have a flamethrower, a piece of crap. She kicked at the weapon on the ground. And because of those. She nodded her head at the smoldering pile that had been the beast. And what it is, we're not really sure. From what we can tell, it's some sort of gnarly parasite, probably alien is my guess. Starts off really tiny, almost looks like a leech, and then it burrows its way into the center of a massive tree. It grows until it fills the thing from within, eating away at all the wood inside, and it uses the bark as something of an exoskeleton for its body, which is pretty vulnerable otherwise. Somehow it only brought up more questions. Who is we? Does the park service know about this? My mind began to put seemingly unrelated pieces of a puzzle together. Is that why the trail was closed? There was never a forest fire, was there? She sighed, lifting herself to her feet with a little bit of effort. Listen, you're full of questions and that's understandable. You were almost attacked by a giant tree monster. I'm also in excruciating pain because I was just pummeled by a tree monster. It's also understandable, so I'm going to answer the few questions you just asked, and then I'll ask you one of my own. Depending on the answer, you go about your day as you like, and I'll head to my post to lick my wounds until backup arrives. Cool? Uh, depending on... Uh, yeah, okay. I muttered, curiosity taking hold. She nodded. The we I referred to as my organization or group or whatever, the rangers... So, the park service does know about. No interrupting, she said firmly, her eyes dark with irritation. I nodded to continue. No, they don't, or maybe they do and don't recognize it officially, I don't know. We're not the park service rangers, well. A lot of us are, but that's just because it makes the job easier. We call ourselves the rangers, and it's not just a US thing, though. We're pretty big in Canada and Mexico. We keep an eye on anywhere in nature that there are run-ins between people and the things that go bump in the night. It's our job to prevent stuff like what you just saw today from interfering in the lives of the general public. She coughed a bit, wincing and grabbing her chest at the movement. So now, the park service and the other rangers at large probably don't know. 
but we've got people among them that do. And once I took care of the clearing, the affected area of those things, we were able to push the forest fire angle pretty smoothly and get the path closed to keep people from venturing down this way. Even took out the bridge to make sure any stubborn fools really got the idea. She said the last two things somewhat pointedly, glaring for emphasis, and I could feel my face flush. I guess one must have survived somehow, and we must have missed it. I hope so at least, the alternative is these things are breeding somewhere. She shook her head as if not wanting to consider the thought. Now for my question. She started, staring at me with a look of interest. I take it you're an avid nature guy, probably someone who enjoys going where others wouldn't consider, given the gear and that the path you're on, and the fact that you took it to Dace despite all of her very intentional warnings not to. I nodded. Not sure how to feel, she seemed to have read me. You handled the situation relatively well, clearly. You got this far without it killing you, and technically, you saved my life under pressure. I wanted to say something in argument, but couldn't think of what. She wasn't wrong, and now that the experience was over, I couldn't lie. I was feeling more alive than I could remember. Though, if she was trying to allude to all of this being some act of skill, I was strongly in disagreement. I think I'll be out of commission for a while, and you're already quite familiar with this area, I imagine. And you've experienced firsthand what I'm out here to stop. Rise looking for new people in our ranks, and there is a specific but odd type most suitable. Animal experts, nature lovers, and others have all proven useful for a variety of reasons. And something tells me that you would fit in as a ranger. She paused. We'd better get you a flamethrower, of course. She gave it another firm kick. My head spun at the invitation to a group that I had only just learned existed, and still somehow had my doubts. I had a job, but it was nothing that served as any strong motivation to say no. I scoured my brain for logical reasons to reject and found a very few, besides the obvious. Would I want to experience something like this again? If I say no, and if I talk about any of this, will you guys? I didn't want to say it, for fear that she would confirm. Kill you, she laughed and then winced. Literally, don't make me laugh, it hurts. No, with something like this, you honestly could walk right out of here right now and talk all you want. Not to seem all sinister, shadowy group on you, but who's gonna believe someone claiming they were attacked by a tree monster and saved by a secret group of park rangers? Heck, go share your story. It might be therapeutic and scare off a few more morons from doing what you did. I opened my mouth to argue but couldn't think of what I was arguing with. I mean, she was right. There was no way to tell my story in any public form without sounding insane. It's a big decision, I get it, here. She ruffled through her pocket for a card. It bore the same logo that her weapon had. The outline of a pine tree with a vague, sinister figure lurking behind it. Three human shapes clasping hands at the bottom, surrounding the tree as though keeping the force behind it at bay. Beneath it were the word, Rangers in bold. The year 1999 beneath it in smaller text. Below that, what I took to be the group's mantra. To protect those who venture into the great outdoors from the evil that occupies the great unknown. A number ran across the other side. If you make a decision, call. Otherwise, you should get going. I didn't know what else to say, so I nodded, thanking her as I turned and left the clearing. The drive back home was silent. My mind was played by more than I had arrived with for once leaving the park. I tried to ignore what just happened, to do what I had heard people claim to do with impossible experiences and just move on. Try to dismiss it as a faulty memory or a dream. But I couldn't. The car just sitting on my desk, growing more tempting by the day. The experience was horrifying, nightmare-inducing, and yet... I couldn't pretend the exhilaration I had felt wasn't greater than anything I had experienced in my day-to-day -day life. It's why I began writing this. I thought that if I share my story somewhere, I wouldn't be decreed as a lunatic, and it would scratch whatever itch is tempting me to make that call. I know that it was wrong, though. As I was writing this, I found myself more tempted than ever, and before long, I had done it. It had been her that had answered, recognizing me almost immediately. 
The details of what followed of her, another story and another day. But by the end of the call, my life had been changed. There are things that lurk in the forests of Illinois. Creatures that make themselves look like the trees and possess an insatiable bloodlust. I suppose to take this as a warning not to do what I did. Stay off of the closed trail no matter how suspicious it seems. It's probably like that for a very good reason. If you don't though, all this not necessarily lost. Try and find your nearest ranger. You might just get lucky. This show was sponsored by BetterHelp. Relationships can often be very difficult to navigate. For my significant other and I, communication is key. And understanding that just because things aren't always easy doesn't mean that it's wrong. The best relationships come from both people being willing to put in the time to make things work. A therapy can be a place to work through the challenges that you face in all of your relationships. Whether with friends, at work, your significant other, or anyone. Therapy can empower you to be the best version of yourself, and it lets you take the time to self-reflect and truly understand what you're feeling. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit BetterHelp.com slash MrCreeps today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash MrCreeps. His shoulder was broken, the arm hanging limply at his side like a loose bag of sand. The sweat forced itself out of the pores in his face and skin peeled off the burns in his hands. It wasn't a good position to be in under the circumstances, and the situation didn't seem likely to improve. But he did have one thing working in his favor. He didn't care if he survived. Are you alright? I asked, cringing at the ludicrousness of the question. He looked up at me, his eyes swollen nearly shut. Yeah, I'm just peachy, he said, sarcasm dripping from every word. Sorry, I just don't know what else to say. Isn't much to say, is there? Unless you want to talk about... No, I said before he could finish the sentence. Let's talk about how we're going to get out of here. He leaned over, wincing as he did, and peeked over the side of the cliff. How about you give me a little shove? That should do the trick. Yeah, very funny. You know that I'm not going to do that. He glared at me. Well, then maybe I should give you a shove and make things quicker. How about we focus on the positive? You know this only ends one way. If you try to save me, you get killed in the process. Especially with... Hey, we don't know for sure, okay? I said packing up the supplies that we had and trying to form some kind of plan to keep us alive long enough to get to safety. Besides, we've been best friends since what? Grade school? If I haven't already been tempted to toss you off a cliff, I'm not going to start now. I stepped over to the edge and glanced down. The wind whipped me in the face, sending a chill through me. Even though it was spring, there was still enough chill in the air to make me shiver. I watched as the sun headed toward the horizon. It would be dark before we got out if I didn't hurry up. My right knee collapsed as he kicked me in the back of the leg. I stumbled, my knees hitting the ground hard, rolling me toward the edge. My hand shot out and grabbed the log, saving me from a horrible death hundreds of feet below. What the heck is wrong with you? I said, lying on the ground and breathing hard. I told you, this only ends one way. Might as well get it over with. I stared at him, not believing what I was hearing. You're serious, I said. I thought you were just being you. Look at me, I'm in excruciating pain. My shoulder's a mess and I have burns on my hands. And I'm not going to be able to climb down. 
And even if I could, there's no safety from. We have to try, I said. I didn't bring you here to die. I wish you wouldn't have brought me here at all. There was no way to know this was going to happen. He stared at me. Doubt filled his eyes. I turned away and focused on filling my pack with what I hoped was the right combination of supplies. I couldn't make the pack too heavy because I needed to lower him down and possibly carry him too. I tied together all the rope that we had and double checked the knots. I clipped the carabiner to his climbing rig, checking to make sure that it was still intact and that the fire hadn't damaged it. I stepped back to admire my handiwork. He was doing the same. Really? He said. This is your big plan. Sure. I said, smiling, proud of myself and my ingenuity. Why not just ring the dinner bell for every predator as you dangle me like a carrot? You know what, you're right, I said. It's not worth all this trouble. I raised my foot and shoved his good arm, sending him toppling over the edge of the cliff. I heard him scream as he fell then, then silence. Thank God, I said, sighing. I was getting so tired of listening to his whining. I heard that, he said from over the edge. I stepped up and peered over. He was dangling there ten feet from the top of the ledge. Oh dang, I thought I had killed you, I said chuckling. He looked up and saw me peeking over. You actually did it, he said. Well, isn't that what you wanted? For me to throw you off the cliff? How's that working out for you? He glared daggers at me. Makes you appreciate life when you think you're about to die, doesn't it? I said. You'll pay for this. What, for saving your life? Okay, I'll take responsibility for that. I began the long, arduous process of lowering him down. I only hoped that I had enough rope. After a while, the strain took its toll. I was exhausted and sweaty. My hand slipped and I had to quickly recover to keep him from smashing into the ground. I managed to slow the rope at the cost of my hands getting rope burn. I tied it off to a tree and I leaned over to check on him. You okay? I yelled. I couldn't see exactly what he was doing. It looked like he had raised his arm but I couldn't tell. I grabbed my binoculars and peered down only to see that he was giving me the finger. Hey, back at ya, I yelled. I need to take a breather. Are you going to be alright for a few minutes? His answer was to slump his head. I guessed that he was taking a nap. I sat next to the log and got out a bottle of water, taking a long drink. After a few minutes, I pulled out my knife and cut some strips off the bottom of my shirt and wrapped them around the palms of my hands and tied them off. Why didn't I think of that before I started lowering him, I thought. I was about to start another session of lowering when I saw the rope vibrating. Huh, that's weird, I thought. What are you doing down there, I yelled, stepping to the edge and looking down. My spine turned to ice when I saw nothing. He wasn't there. Adrian, I yelled. No response. Adrian! I yelled again, quickly pushing away thoughts of the Rocky movies. I pulled the rope and it came up with no resistance. I reeled in the entire length and at the end, there was no sign of Adrian. The rope didn't look like it had been cut. It looked like it had been torn or chewed. I stared at it for a long time. Memories of the horrible events that led up to this moment overwhelmed me. I collapsed to the ground in fear. My eyes darted around like my head was on a swivel. Every tree became a hiding place for that thing. I could feel it lurking in every bush. My mind started replaying when the trouble had first started. We made it to the top of the cliff and celebrated by starting a campfire and making some coffee while we set up our tents. Adrian was actually in a good mood if you can imagine, and we stayed up by the fire until well after midnight. The following morning, his mood had changed. Way to keep me up all night, he said, pouring a fresh cup of coffee and looking like he needed it. 
What are you talking about? Oh, don't play innocent, he said. You know you were hanging around my tent, circling it late last night, growling and pawing the ground. Yeah, trying to scare me. My eyes went wide as he talked. I swear, I was in my tent the whole time. I fell asleep as soon as my head hit the pillow. Then what was making all that racket? He said with doubt creeping into his eyes. Uh, maybe I was snoring and you heard that. Trust me, this wasn't a snore. Well, if it wasn't me then, I narrowed eyes at him. Wait a minute, I know what you're doing. What am I doing? He said, looking at his coffee cup. You're trying to scare me with some campfire ghost story hoping that I would wig out. I'm telling you, it's not some campfire story. It really happened. Yeah, okay. It said making it clear that I didn't believe a single word. I mean it, he said, starting to get angry. Okay, I said. Don't get your panties in a bunch. You better. He started saying and then stopped. His eyes were focused on something behind me. I'm not falling for that, I said, refusing to look until I heard a branch snap behind me. I turned and saw. I shook my head to clear the memory. I don't want to think about that right now, I told myself. I need to focus on finding out what happened to Adrian. I stood and checked my supplies and then double checked to be sure the rope was securely tied to the tree. I avoided looking around for fear of what might be lurking. Then, once everything was set, I stared down at the deadly ground that waited for me to make a mistake, muttered a quick prayer and then jumped off the cliff. Repelling down was more difficult with a pack on my back and rags wrapped around my already rope-burned hands. I took it slow, working my way down the same way that Adrian had gone. I also went slow for fear of finding what I didn't want to find. I knew it was possible, so I made sure to be as quiet as I could. The rock face was rough, and I did my best to not knock loose any pebbles or do anything that would announce my presence. In a best-case scenario, his rope got frayed on the rocks and it broke. I hoped that I would find him laying on an outcropping nearby, unconscious but alive. As I descended, I noticed an opening in the rock wall. My rope was in a straight line with it. I imagined Adrian's rope was too. I stopped and swung myself over to the rock face, grabbing a bigger rock and pulling myself to it. I pulled my rope up and stashed it, and then climbed down the side of the opening. There was a small ledge in front of it that I had landed on and peered inside. It was dark as pitch. Even though the sun had just set, it seemed like daylight couldn't penetrate the darkness. I pulled on my flashlight and slowly explored the opening with it. It turned out to be a large cave. I stepped inside and walking upright, my head easily cleared the ceiling by a good three feet. Curiosity overtook me as I shined the light around this newfound hall of mysteries. There were no markings on the walls and the floor was rough like the cave had formed in naturally instead of somebody making it. But then, why would somebody make a cave halfway up a cliff face where it's nearly impossible to get to? I wasn't sure that I really wanted to know the answer. As I continued inside, the air became cooler. I hugged myself and I fought off a chill. This cave was much bigger than I originally thought. I walked a short distance before I noticed the smell. Actually, it was two smells that intertwined with each other. The first was the smell of fire. Not like a rushing wildfire coming to burn me to a crisp, but more like a campfire. The second smell was much less encouraging. It was the smell of decay. Some animal had died in here. There was no doubt about it. I hesitated for a moment, wondering if perhaps I had explored far enough. My wondering ceased when I remembered why I was here in the first place. Adrian was still missing. If he had come down here, it didn't seem like he was coerced. At least I didn't see any sign of drag marks on the ground or a struggle. But then again, it was hard to tell on the rough rock floor. 
I suddenly stopped unsure of what to do. The passageway split in two, and I shone my light at the right one and then the left. Neither seemed to show any clue of which was the correct path. I stared at each for a long moment and then mentally flipped a coin and went right. As soon as I took a few steps, I could feel the strong wind blowing in my face, carrying the smells of fire and rot with it. I nearly backed up and took the other path, but this was where I would most likely find Adrian. At least I hoped I would. As I walked, I noticed a slight glow ahead. I turned off my flashlight and followed the ever-increasing light. When I turned the corner, I saw Adrian lying on the ground in front of the fire. He didn't seem to be injured well, at least not any more than he already was. I didn't see any blood near him. I did, however, see a pile of bones tossed in the corner behind him. It disturbed me to see the pile and think about my friend's bones eventually laying there. I took a step forward to go check on him and then suddenly stopped. The huge rock that had been sitting by the fire had suddenly moved. I recognized it right away from the size and the color of the hair that covered it. I stepped back out of view and began shaking. I knew that I only had two options. Kill this thing or hide from it. There was nothing in my bag that would kill it. I didn't have a gun with me and I doubted a pocket knife would do the trick. I had to find somewhere to hide and to the left. My mind ran in circles trying to think of a hiding place when it dawned on me. I turned and went back to the other passageway as quietly as I could. Once there, I stepped inside thinking it would be a long cavern like its counterpart. However, it was almost immediately blocked. I shone my flashlight on the blockage and was horrified to find that it was piled up with clothes. Shirts, pants, shoes, and even the occasional backpack. It was all piled nearly to the ceiling of the cave. And more disturbingly, each article had blood on it. There didn't seem to be any of that escaped damage either. Most were ripped or chewed, probably like their unfortunate owners. I remember hearing about hikers going missing in this park, but I thought it was just normal stuff like in any other park. People get lost or fall into some hidden crevice or ravine. I guess not. My mind screamed for me to get out of there, fast, but I needed to know that Adrian was okay, and somehow try to rescue him too, although at the moment that seemed impossible. The longer that I stared at the clothes of these poor helpless victims, the more it formed into an idea. I grabbed some of the clothes and pushed them aside, digging my way toward the bottom of the seemingly endless pile. I wondered how many missing people it took before a major investigation started. I reached the bottom and took my pack off, setting it beside me, and then I pulled clothes down on top of me, leaving a small space for me to peek out through. There was just a hint of light coming from the mouth of the cave, but it was rapidly dwindling. I slowly unzipped all the zippers on my pack so I had easy access without making a sound when I needed something. I settled in and tried to make a comfortable seat out of the clothes. My conscience was not happy using the clothes of murder victims for comfort, but I saw no alternative. If I ran, that thing would hunt me down. It already found us once. I must have been more tired than I thought. Once settled in, I fell asleep almost immediately. I turned and it was there. I wasn't even sure what it was. It was dark and hairy, and it stood on its back legs but hunched over as if readying for an attack. I was petrified. Adrian, I said. What? he asked. Is that what you heard? Yeah, I'm thinking so, he said quietly, barely moving his mouth as if the monster wouldn't attack if you didn't speak. What do we do? I said through clenched teeth. How the heck should I know? It was circling us and moving closer at the same time. Its sharp teeth dripped with drool. Did you bring a gun? I said. No, did you? I slowly shook my head. It stopped and looked at me as though it understood the whole conversation. 
It stopped lurching and stood to its full height. It must have been at least eight feet. It lunged at me with incredible speed. I screamed and tried to run, but my foot got caught on the log and I fell over backwards, knocking the wind out of me. In the end, that was a good thing. The monster lunged at my torso, but since I fell, my torso was laying on the ground with the rest of me. It flew through the air, sailing right over me. I looked over at Adrian and saw his pocket knife in his hand. The monster saw it too. It narrowed its eyes at him and snapped its jaws. I was surprised by how much its head and snout reminded me of a dog. This was my thought as I lay there on my back, helpless, unable to breathe. I watched as it lunged at Adrian. I saw him plunge the knife into its chest and it howled in pain. It never slowed even as he stabbed it. It merely twisted in the air as it grabbed his arms, pinning them to his side. I heard the crunch as they both landed together on top of Adrian's shoulder. He screamed as they continued to roll right into the fire. Adrian tried to push his way out of the flames, severely burning his hand by grabbing a burning piece of wood and swinging it in a huge arc, smashing it right into the face of the monster. It whimpered and growled, and then disappeared as quickly and silently as it came. It took me a while to be able to move. When I could, I crawled over to Adrian who was laying still beside the fire. Are you okay? I said rolling him onto his back. He screamed in pain as I rolled him onto his injured shoulder. Uh, sorry, I said. Get away from me. He said as I helped him to a sitting position and looked at his burned hand. Are you alright? I said. Yeah, I'm just peachy. I woke with a start but didn't know why. I reached for my flashlight and was about to turn it on when I heard the sound of sniffing. I froze. Every ounce of concentration was on being as still as possible. The sniffing got louder. I didn't dare even open my eyes for fear that it would somehow see them and that would be it. I could feel its presence getting closer. I fought that the panic that would make me do something stupid like try to run. I just closed my eyes and thought about the last sunrise that I had seen, hoping that it wouldn't be the last one I would ever see. I felt the snout touch the layer of clothes right in front of me, and then it paused as if it was deciding if it wanted to eat me now or save me for a snack later on. The monster withdrew so silently that I barely knew that it was gone. I waited for it to return. I knew it was waiting for me to make a move so it could catch me, but I didn't. I sat as still as a statue for what seemed like hours. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to move. I had to stretch. I stood and stretched my arms and legs, but still quiet. When I sat back down and made sure that I was covered by clothes, I risked a little bit of light through my hand to get a bite to eat. Opening a granola bar without making noise is a tedious job at best. It took me a half hour and after I ate, my only reward was thirst. I sipped on my bottle of water, avoiding the temptation to gulp it down. I didn't know when I would be able to fill it. I checked my watch and it was one in the morning. At the same time, Adrian had heard the growling. I took a chance that this thing would be out hunting at night. I pushed my layer of clothes off of me and grabbed my flashlight and I went to check on Adrian. I stepped carefully and kept my light pointed at the ground just in case. My ears strained to hear any sounds. Of course, there were the echoes of my footsteps, making me whip around thinking the monster was right behind me. I made it to the main cave without having a full on panic attack. The fire had burned low and a dull orange glow lit the walls. I found Adrian lying in the same spot as before. He didn't seem to be moving. I leaned down and listened for breathing. I could hear a faint breath. Adrian, I whispered, shaking him. Come on, man, we gotta go. He moved a little. Adrian, I said, looking around to be sure that it wasn't sneaking up on me. 
Adrian, come on. He opened his eyes, just a slit, and put his hand up to shade his eyes from the light. You still with me, buddy? I said. He tried to speak, but nothing came out. Here, drink a little water. I gave him a few sips, and he perked up a little. Why? He rasped. Why what, buddy? Why are you here? I came to rescue you. Leave me. I'm not going to do that. In the distance, I heard a howl. It chilled me to the bone. I wondered how far away it was and if it was celebrating another victim. Okay, listen, I'm going to go, but I'll be back when I'm sure it's out of the cave. I gave him another drink. You hang on, okay? He closed his eyes and laid his head back down. I stared at him for a moment and then I jumped up and ran out of the cave. I turned at the fork and buried myself back under the clothes, turning off the light as soon as I was set. It wasn't five minutes later that I heard something lumber by in the cave. I had cut it way too close. I needed to take mental notes of when it went out. I stole a glance at my watch. It was 1.37 in the morning. I drank the last swallow of water and I laid down in my nest of clothes. I woke up sometime later. The cave was dimly lit. I could see a bright light coming from the opening, but it didn't penetrate all the way to my nest. I could see the walls near the opening, but not much else. As I watched, a massive shadow blocked my view. It was standing right in front of me. I became still as a stone. What was it doing? Did it know that I was there or was it toying with me? Sweat poured off my brow. I knew that I was about to die. I gripped my flashlight tight knowing that it wouldn't do much to the monster, but at least I would go down fighting. And then something fell on top of me. It wasn't very heavy so I knew that it wasn't the monster. I waited for a long moment until I heard it walk away, before I used the flashlight to see what was on top of me. I shone the light in the pile and I found new clothes. There was a shirt, shorts, underwear, and a bra. I knew it from the monster's latest victim. My heart went out to that poor woman. I wished there was something that I could do to help her, but there wasn't. I was barely surviving myself. My water was gone. I had three granola bars left, and that was the last of my food. I had to do something before I didn't have the energy to escape. This was my last chance. Usually, the monster kept to a schedule. I assumed governed by hunger and thirst. I knew that it wouldn't go out again for hours and I could leave. I could sneak out and be gone without it, knowing that I was ever here. But I couldn't. I had to rescue Adrian. But why, my mind said. Well, because he's my friend, I thought. Would he leave you behind? Of course not, he would be doing exactly what I'm doing now. Oh really, that's why I tried to trip you and throw you off the cliff. That wasn't real, he was joking around. Well, he didn't seem like he was joking. He seemed like he wanted to die and take you with him. He was upset. How upset do you think he'd be waiting here in this cave to rescue you? Oh very, he'd probably be waking out. He never was much for small places. Do you think he would have left by now? Yeah, maybe, but the important thing is, I'm not him. Well, you could leave right now. No. Who cares if you save your friend and die in the process? I do. Do you really think that thing doesn't know you're here? What? That thing is playing you. It's stalking you. Waiting for you to make a mistake. No, I've outsmarted it. I've learned its routine. Yeah, I keep thinking that. Maybe you can outsmart its teeth as it's chewing you to pieces. I'm not leaving yet. End of conversation. I waited for a response that never came. Even though I decided to wait, there were things that still bothered me. Was it toying with me? Did it really not know that I was here? Why hadn't it killed Adrian yet? Was it leaving him alive to bait me in? 
The more that I thought about such things, the more I felt panic rising inside me. I pushed the clothes aside and the dull glow shone from the mouth of the cave. It called to me. It told me that the coast was clear and that I needed to go right now. I felt my muscles tighten, getting ready to rise and run out of the cave. I pushed the clothes over more, clearing a path, when suddenly I heard something. I quickly and quietly buried myself under the clothes. I had barely stopped moving when I heard the monster lumber through. It paused in front of the clothes, sniffing the air, and then turned back toward the mouth of the cave and disappeared. I waited for a full minute before I breathed a sigh of relief. My own ingenuity had nearly gotten me killed. I was sure that thing wouldn't be going back outside for hours and yet it had left within minutes. I began to doubt myself and my own intelligence for taking such a risk. It was time to leave. I dug out from under the clothes and started for the mouth of the cave, and then I stopped and turned back. I had to try one more time to get Adrian out. I went deeper into the cave to the main room with the fire pit. There was a freshly made fire which told me that I didn't have much time. Adrian was still lying there beside the fire and I went to him and leaned down. Hey, time to go buddy, I whispered. He didn't answer me back. I know it's going to be tough but you need to try. I grabbed his shoulders and gently shook him. Come on, man, you gotta wake up. His eyes didn't open. Something about his shoulders felt wrong. Aside from the fact that one of them was either dislocated or broken, and should have caused him excruciating pain, he didn't twitch. The other thing was that the shoulders felt cold. Not just a little chilly, but they were stone cold. Adrian? I pressed my fingers against his neck and felt for a pulse. There was nothing. His neck felt cold as well. I pushed him and his body clumsily rolled over onto his back. I tried to move his arms and legs but I couldn't. Rigor mortis had already said it. I stared in disbelief. My friend was gone. Not only was my friend gone but I had wasted all this time trying to rescue him. Maybe I had killed myself in the process. I wiped the tears from my cheeks and pulled Adrian's body back into the same position. My only chance was for this horrible monster not to know that I was here. I stood next to the fire letting the smoke wash over me in the hope that it might somehow cover my scent. After a couple of minutes I looked back over at my friend, said a silent goodbye and walked back out of the cave. I stopped at my hiding place and climbed inside hoping this would be the last time I waited for death to pass by. I settled in and took a nap to prepare for my escape. A short while later I woke up hearing the monster pass by. I waited. When I thought that it was time, I slowly and silently packed my backpack and then stood to leave. As strange as it sounds, I knew that I would miss this place. It had been a refuge of safety for the last two days even though it was a constant reminder of death. I stood at the edge of the pile and tried to rearrange them so that nothing looked amiss. And then I turned toward the mouth of the cave and started making my way out. It was late afternoon and the sun shone brightly in my face, blinding me. I hadn't realized how bright the sun was until I was without it for a couple of days. As I stood at the mouth of the cave, my first problem had presented itself. I looked over the edge and it was a good 50 to 80 feet to the ground. That would be why people left the cave alone. They couldn't get to it. I searched the surroundings looking for a solution when one had presented itself. There were vines hanging from the trees that looked like they might support me. The problem was as they weren't in reach. My arm would need to be a foot or so longer. They sat so tantalizingly close that I had to try leaning out to grab one. That ended when I nearly stumbled off the ledge and fell to my death. I searched for any other way, but there was none. I just had to go for it. I backed up a few steps and then took a deep, cleansing breath and ran. 
I jumped at the last minute and grabbed for the vines. My hands wrapped around them, but I was already falling and I had to wrap my legs around them too and squeeze for all I was worth to slow my descent. My hands and legs were burning as they slowed me, but I didn't dare scream. The cave was still too close. Even sliding down the vines may have been too loud. My hands were failing. I didn't know how much longer I could hang on. My fingers let go one by one and I fell. I landed on my back and the backpack cushioned my fall. Fortunately, I had only been around 10 feet from the ground when I did. It still knocked the wind out of me and left me laying there helpless as I looked back up at the cave opening. Only I could no longer see it. It must have been invisible from ground level. Once I could breathe again, I focused on getting out of here. I stood and tried to get my bearings. The sun was setting so I knew which way west was. It was around two miles to the south where the trailhead was. My car, my salvation, waited there for me. I made my way through the trees and headed south when there was an opening. Before I knew it, I had to run across a trail. I stepped onto it, feeling more relieved than I had in days. And then I heard something in the brush behind me. I froze. I turned toward the sound and saw the predator. It was a mountain lion, not the horrible monster that I had just escaped. But it didn't matter if this cat was hungry, I would be just as dead. I tried to nonchalantly continue walking on the trail, hoping that it would lose interest. My walk turned into a power walk and still the lion followed. It seemed to be closing the distance between us without breaking into a run yet. I tried to remember what to do in case of a mountain lion attack, but all I remembered was, don't run. I thought of this as I power walked away from the pursuing cat that was getting closer by the minute. Suddenly, I was hit from behind. The lion had jumped on me, but fortunately it had jumped on my pack. Its weight held me down, making me helpless as it climbed up my pack heading for the neck. I covered my head and neck hoping to survive. I could feel its hot breath against my fingers. I knew an attack was imminent. And then it stopped. It lifted its head and I could hear it sniffing the air. In an instant, it leaped off of me and was gone. I sat up and looked around, not believing my luck when I noticed the forest had gone silent. The only reason a predator runs away like that is there's a bigger predator in the area. My mind reminded me. I had a very good idea which predator had scared it off. This was it. Fight or flight. I jumped up and ran at full speed sprint down the trail. I didn't know that I had that much energy left after the last few days, but death sure is a great motivator. And I knew this thing wasn't coming to congratulate me for escaping its lair. My legs burned. I had a stitch on my side. My backpack was throwing off my balance and I nearly fell, but I could see the trailhead. There was a glint of metal that was on the front bumper of my car. All I had to do was keep going. I could hear panting behind me. My footsteps weren't the only ones running on the trail. It sounded more like a gallop behind me. For a fleeting moment, I almost stopped to see if I was being chased by a horse, but I knew that would be a fatal mistake. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the keys, pressing the button and unlocking the doors. I didn't want to make the same mistake that I had seen in dozens of horror movies. I was one of the ones screaming the loudest when the victim had dropped the keys. I ripped open the driver's door and dove inside. I had just shut it when a nightmare landed on the hood. I stared at it for a moment, transfixed by this horrific apparition. It looked like somebody had taken a dog and turned it into a horrible beast. It was massive, at least eight feet tall. Its fangs were sharp and red. They drooled onto the windshield as the red eyes stared at me. It reached back with its paw and smashed into my windshield nearly breaking through. I woke from my stupor and started the car as it smashed the windshield again, this time actually breaking through. It shoved its snout inside and snapped at me as I put the car in reverse and floored it, turning hard and making the beast tumble off to the ground. 
I threw it in drive and stomped the pedal to the floor. The car lurched forward with rubber screeching in protest. I gained momentum when the monster landed on the roof with a crash. It began pounding over and over. I saw claw marks coming through the metal and into the cloth on the ceiling. In desperation, I began swarming back and forth, trying to shake the monster loose. Metal and rubber protested at my maneuvers with the extra weight on top. I wondered if the car would flip and end my escape in bloody fashion. So far, the road had been a part drive that was never meant for such speeds. I knew that there was a hard turn coming up and I wouldn't make it as fast as I was driving. I slammed on the brakes, sending the monster flying. I stomped on the gas and swerved around, continuing to gain speed. As tempting as it was, I knew if I had tried to run it over, my car would never survive. And right now, survival was all that mattered. I looked in the rearview mirror and didn't possibly. It was catching up to me. I saw it leave, trying to land in the car again, but I swerved in time, leaving it only asphalt to land on. I made another hard turn and I was on a state road. The monster followed me, but I was able to get enough speed to finally escape. I breathed a sigh of relief as I sped toward town. I didn't bother going home. I went straight to the police department. After waiting a half hour to make it to the front desk, I was finally interviewed by an officer. When I started my story, he seemed to be only mildly interested. And by the time that I was done, there were six officers standing around listening. That was one heck of a story. The officer said, looking around at the other officer, smirking. It's true, I said. The officer sighed as the others dispersed. I'm sorry, son, as entertaining as that was, I'm too busy to go chasing around the woods hunting after some urban legend. I took a piece of paper off his notepad and wrote down a series of numbers. What's this? He said when I handed it to him. I had a GPS with me, I said. Those numbers are the location of the cave that has all the evidence you need. Listen, son, without something concrete... There's no one who's going to go out to the middle of the woods chasing a fairy tale. Well, maybe that'll help. I said getting up and setting my backpack on his desk. I opened the zippers and dumped clothes out to them. Whoa, 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 what is this? Concrete, I said. These are the clothes of this thing's victims. If you take DNA samples from the sweat and blood on them, you might find matches to some people who have recently gone missing. You're serious, he said looking from the clothes to me as if just waking up. Yes, I said as I got up and started toward the door, if it's not too much trouble. I walked out leaving several officers staring at the pile of clothes. I got into my destroyed car hoping that it would start and I headed home. The entire way I kept glancing in the rearview mirror. After all this, there were two things that captured my thoughts. One, I would be barricading my house as soon as I got home. And two, I wouldn't be sleeping soundly ever again. I worked as a park ranger in northern Alaska for years from when I was in my early 20s until my mid-30s. At first, when I took the job, I was trying to escape. But over time, I learned to love it. The endless wilderness, the snow-capped mountains, the muffled way everything sounded during blizzards. With no light pollution, the stars up there looked like tiny chips of diamond. And during the winter, the northern lights roll in, twisting and shimmering in strange alien colors. But a few years ago, things got much worse. People up here have started to go missing at an alarming rate and I started having strange experiences around the park and at the nature preserve. One of these strangest parts of my story started on a freezing dark night in 2018. I was on a snowmobile out in a terrible blizzard. The conditions were nearly to the point of being impassable. The snow was falling so thick and fast that it looked like a moving, shimmering wall of white on all sides of me. Another ranger, a huge lumbering man named Ace Acosta, pulled up behind me on a second snowmobile. 
I looked at him, standing six foot six with majestic peaks stretching up into the night sky, and thought about what a great picture this would make. As I was looking around, I saw the faint tracks in the snow. Ace's snowmobile lights were pointed in their direction, and I had been standing almost on top of them without realizing it, which is fairly easy to do when a few inches of snow were falling every hour. At first, I thought it was the frozen tracks of an injured animal. I saw the drops of blood soaked into the superficial ice first. Following the direction of my eyes, I realized that they were footprints pressed into the frozen crust, leading away from me and towards the flat stretch of the tundra. I squinted, getting down on my knees and leaning inwards. I didn't want to trample the tracks. I quickly realized that I was looking at human footprints. Naked human footprints. But who would be out here in December in negative 40 degree winds without shoes? They would die rapidly out here. Just for me to drive across the tundra on a snowmobile required me to wear three jackets, long johns, snow pants, thick jeans, a ski mask, and multiple layers of socks and gloves with hand warmers. I wore special waterproof boots with composite toes that wouldn't freeze like steel toes. And despite all of this, I was still cold. I moved forward and saw handprints mixed in with the footprints, all of them bloody. The ice was thick enough to slice open human hands and feet undoubtedly. The logical conclusion was unshakable. Someone had crawled through here, maybe naked on all fours and their frozen body would be somewhere up ahead. I sighed, turning to Acosta. He still stood in the same position, his face covered in a red scarf with only his eyes showing. I saw one ice-covered eyebrow raise questioningly. I think we got us a body somewhere nearby, I said, getting back on my snowmobile and starting it. He did the same. What kind of freaked out tweaker would be walking around here without clothes on? Ace asked in his deep baritone. Man, I need a hit of whatever that guy's on. I've got two sweaters and two winter jackets on and I'm still cold. Eh, uh, Kelton, um, what do you say? He started elbowing me jokingly. I frowned, not responding. Ace always had a smart aleck remark. He was next to me when I was interviewed for this job originally, down at the recruitment center in Washington State. The old lady doing the interviewing was a bloodless, angry-looking specimen of a woman, with huge glasses that magnified her eyes twice over. She spat out each question like a drill sergeant, talking to fresh meat in the army. Are you a member of any organized religion? She had asked brusquely. Ace shook his head. No man, but I am a member of a disorganized religion, he said. We call ourselves these servants of the old ones. We're waiting for the ancient reptilian gods at the bottom of the ocean to awaken. So far, however, they haven't responded to any of our attacks. I thought about this as I revved the engine twice a sign that I was about to pull off and that he should stay close. We took off, going slow and following the tracks as close as possible without destroying them. But they just kept on going. The blood stains seeming to grow fainter as we moved forward. And strangely enough, the hand and footprints also started getting longer, as if someone were running on all fours and speeding up. We were nearing the beginning of the Forest of Evergreens when I saw a white flash just up ahead. The thing that ran from us was humanoid, but I knew at once that it was no person. It ran on hands and feet, totally naked, its skin a pale, lifeless white color. It turned its head towards the lights of the snowmobiles briefly. I saw a hairless creature with skin that clung tightly to its simian body its lips permanently pulled back from its mouth as if they were eaten away. 
Underneath it showed a mottled of black and red gums covered in thick and clotted blood. Its nose appeared as little more than two irregular holes, and its eyes they reflected the light of the snowmobiles, like the eyes of a raccoon or a possum. They were huge and sunken in its starving and monstrous face, and I saw what was leaving the bloody trails. The creature was, as far as I could tell, totally uninjured. In its permanently grinning mouth between rows of crooked, sharp, and blood-stained teeth, it held the body of an infant. The baby's head lolled from side to side, the neck seemingly broken and blood dripped constantly from its mouth and nose. It had deep puncture marks in its tiny parka, half rings of teeth marks that must have broken its ribs. The blood stains on the snow were becoming fainter because the heart was no longer pumping in the body of the one leaving them. I had a loaded rifle inside of my snowmobile and I kept a 12 gauge shotgun slung around my back, mostly in case of bear or moose attack. I always kept the shotgun loaded with slugs which were in my experience the most versatile ammunition for stopping any large animal. The 308 might take down a polar bear, at least with a good headshot, or it might just piss it off on a bad day. But a shotgun slug to the head or heart will stop any bear or moose in its tracks. Of course, this was no polar bear ahead of me. For all I knew, it was something far worse. I looked down at the speedometer to see that I was going 20 miles an hour, in the dark and in a blizzard. And yet this strange humanoid creature was still losing us, its seemingly never-ending store of energy still sending it forward at a superhuman speed. Its pale, bony legs and arms pumped back and forth so fast that they were just a blur. It kept its sharp teeth around the nape of the dead infant's neck, like a mother cat carrying its young. I kept one hand on the steering wheel while trying to free the strap of my shotgun over my head. I slowed down below 20 and the creature responded by going even faster. I was making a break for the mountain forest that started only a few hundred feet away. I got the gun free and quickly stopped the snowmobile and raised it. I centered the sights, taking a deep breath to steady myself and I fired. I missed, though I don't know by how much. Shotguns had the drawback of being significantly less accurate at farther distances than the rifle. But by the time that I got the 308 out, I knew the creature would have long since disappeared in the thick brush and trees. By this point, Ace had also stopped and opened fire, but the creature had already gone. Holy crap, Ace screamed. That thing was fast. I can't believe he got away after all that. He heaved a deep sigh. I think we better go find out where he got that baby from, I said. We might have a lot more corpses on our hands than we realize. We found a radio in the snowmobile and messaged in what had happened, or at least the basic gist of it. I left out the part about the naked half-human abomination and said that it was an unknown animal. There wasn't much for law enforcement up in these parts because... I mean, there were barely any people. The rangers, as well as fish and wildlife agents, regularly worked with the police officers in small towns. At least, those that had police officers. Dozens of the local tribal villages had no police at all. These people would come to forest agents and fish and wildlife agents most of all, and were always some of the county's friendliest and most helpful residents. By the time that we got back to the original bloodstained footprints, the snow had covered up the tracks completely. However, based on the direction that the creature had been going and where the tracks had come from, I thought that I knew where it might have started. Following the path in a nearly straight line it led to the Lutna Peak trailer park. Ace and I drove off at max speed across the rolling hills and flat plains, the snow coming faster and heavier now. They say Eskimos have dozens of words for snow, and after being a ranger up here, I can say that I've seen every variation of it a thousand times. 
This was turning into the kind that was wet with huge flakes and tended to stick to everything. We would probably have to find refuge soon, especially if it got any heavier. I heard the screaming before I saw the commotion. As we came around the sharp right turn where the dirt road turned into the trailer park, I saw dozens of people out, flitting like gnats around one of the trailers at the back corner of the park. All the lights were on in that particular trailer, and I saw one woman comforting another who was bent over and crying. Even though almost everybody knew us here, I pulled out my badge identifying me as a federal law enforcement officer. Up here, all the rangers were technically federal agents, allowed to carry guns and make arrests like typical police, except we were licensed under the Department of the Interior rather than under state law enforcement agencies. I ran into the trailer and after one long glance around the place, I knew that there was no need to call for any ambulances. Ace followed close behind me, his heavy thudding footsteps shaking the trailer slightly as he ascended the steps. We said nothing for a long moment. The entire family was dead. There was blood everywhere, even spotting the ceilings. Most of it had frozen in the cold and I wondered how long the door had been left open. Body parts were scattered across the floor, an arm in the corner of the room, a head standing up on the kitchen counter, even a random tooth embedded into the sheetrock. The savagery was brutal, and the amount of strength required to carry out such an attack must have been extraordinary. I think we're going to need a lot more people on this than just you and me, Ace said. I nodded, already bone tired and with so much more work to do tonight before I could go to sleep. We found both state and federal authorities in the area. Since much of the land was tribally owned, we had to deal with multiple branches. Eventually, we got CSI out there in the middle of a snowstorm, though they had to come from over three hours away. We just secured the scene while we waited, constantly being brought into neighboring trailers where townsfolk would tell us the latest gossip. They also brought us hot coffee and tried to milk us for any information that we might have, as they usually did in such situations. No, Maggie, honest, Ace was saying to one old lady wrapped up in an ancient fur coat. I don't know any more about it than you do. You can be sure that you would know if I did. By that point, police cars were slowly pulling in one by one. Ace and I told them a simplified version of the night's events, said goodnight and left the scene to them. I went home and took a scalding hot shower, trying to force the night's coldness out of my bones. And then I slept deeply, though I had nightmares of that creature's face turning to me, holding a dead baby in its mouth and marking me with its emotionless, reflective eyes. I didn't know it then, but that would be the last time that I would sleep in a bed for many days. The state police assigned us an officer the next day, stating that they wanted an official representative of their interests involved in the case. It was by this point a fairly high priority case. We didn't even have many assaults or robberies up here, less likely murders, and the murder of an entire family really stirred up the locals. The fact that the CSI techs couldn't make heads or tails of it made it even worse. They hadn't even agreed on whether it was done by humans or animals, or a combination of the two, like men with fighting dogs who went berserk. With no leads, they wanted us to go back to where we had seen the creature the previous night and to see what we could find. The police officer would be tagging us, a woman named Officer Melinda Jansen had the look of someone who had just started a new job and doesn't realize how terrible it is yet. She was all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and when she shook my hand, she nearly crushed the bones together under her iron grip. I saw Ace wince slightly when he shook her hand too. When she turned her back, she looked at me with one eyebrow raised as if he were saying, What can you do? It didn't take us long to find the spot from the previous night. When we got close to the forest where the creature had disappeared, 
I saw a branch that had been hit by a shotgun blast, and I knew that we were right on the money. In the daytime, I saw that there was a slight curving trail through the trees here, maybe an old deer trail. It was just wide enough for us to take our snowmobiles through if we went slow. Occasionally, I would have to get off being in the lead and move large branches that lay across the path, but overall it was faster going than I had expected. The trail followed across the top of a rolling hill, went down and then spiraled up around a mountain. We were high now, at least 7,000 feet above sea level, and the view went on for hundreds of miles. It was breathtaking, seeing the frozen white landscape below us, mountains lining one horizon and the Arctic Ocean on another. A couple hundred feet ahead of us, however, the trail just stopped. I saw an opening in the mountain, slowly bringing my snowmobile up. I looked into it and saw what looked like naturally formed stone hallways. The hall sloped down at a steep angle without stairs. An eerie silence radiated from the gradually thickening darkness. The other two snowmobiles cut out right behind mine, and Officer Jansen came walking up, flicking on her LED headlamp. Immediately, I saw a strip of light blue cloth. I walked forward, bending down to confirm what I had already suspected, that this was a piece of the missing infant's clothing. That looks like more than enough cause to me. Let's do this, Jansen said. I would like to be back before sundown. She kept walking without waiting for confirmation. Ace and I slung on our packs and turned on our headlamps. I tried using the radios and sat phone to share our location, but neither was working. The bright artificial lights showed that the natural stone walls of the hall just kept on descending into the mountain. A warm breeze blew past me, an acrid, sulfuric smell following in its wake. This is just a body recovery mission at this point, I whispered to Ace, giving Officer Jansen a wide space so that I could talk. So why are we potentially risking our lives here? We should be waiting for backup. We both know that that infant is dead. I mean, it has been for a while. You know what I think, Ace whispered conspiratorially before a low shriek stopped us all in our tracks and ended conversation. I never did get to hear what he thought. By this point, it was much warmer than it had been outside, and I had the urge to start stripping off jackets. The shrieking had intensified, and it was now being answered by dozens of others that surrounded further away in the stone walls. Officer Jansen had pulled out her gun, which I saw with some astonishment was a 454 Ruger, a large caliber gun with good stopping power. I saw enough magazines strapped around her hips to decimate an entire herd of buffalo. I also pulled off my shotgun, making sure that it was filled with lead slugs. Do you have any idea what we're up against? I asked her. Ace was right behind us, his shotgun already cocked and loaded. The muzzle pointed downwards. I was sweating heavily by this point. The air in the tunnel just kept on getting warmer. It felt like I was walking into a sauna. Thin clouds of mist and droplets of hot condensation clung to these smooth granite ceilings. The hall continued to descend at the same steep rate. But now I could see something at the bottom. A light. Not much more than you, really. Officer Jansen said with a slight sneer. My only advice is to shoot first and ask questions later. Kill anything that moves. This place has taken a lot of people already. People who were too fat and slow to watch their own backs. I squinted as I examined the lights. They seemed to emanate from some sort of organism growing on the stone surface. It wasn't electrical lights and it certainly wasn't natural sunlight. It glowed like the lights of millions of fireflies, a purplish-blue color that painted the granite floors and walls in a totally different light. We were walking as quietly as possible by this point, but I still hadn't seen anyone. 
and we reached the bottom of these stone halls, where strange mushrooms glowed in the darkness. Their myclium giving off that black-like color everywhere as it stretched across the threshold of the opening. I turned off my LED, seeing my comrades do the same, and then I poked my head through, looking back and forth. I saw more of those creatures from before, their lips missing, their skin pale, their eyes huge and rabid. They constantly twisted and snapped their heads to the left or right, as if hearing something only they could perceive. Two were dragging an elk that they had torn down the middle. Another was dragging an old man's body forward by the upraised legs. I saw the old man's missing head, his wrinkled hands trailing behind the body. I watched where all this activity was headed, and then I gasped. A huge insectile monster sat lazily against the stone wall as these creatures brought it meat. The monster was so fat that I wasn't even sure that it could stand up. It had a blood red, chitinous exterior with a hood like a cobra's that extended around its head. Its teeth trembled together constantly as it shoved more offerings into its mouth, scenting blood gushing forward in thick clotted rivulets that dripped down its chin. Its long thin arms had a sharp knife-like digits, and its six legs branched like those of a praying mantis, splayed out on each side of its body, shining a dark red color in the strange light of the chamber. Its belly stretched far in front of its body, and with horror, I saw a drop a cluster of eggs, each as big as a dog. Their surfaces writhed and trembled, looking tight and ready to burst at any moment. The creatures that fed and cared for this monster rushed over, dragging the eggs to the corner of the warm chamber. I saw that there were dozens more of them over there, and that some had already hatched. Whatever that monster was, it had already given birth, and now those things were walking around, totally free to kill anything or anyone they wanted. This was the nightmare that took place years ago when I was a park ranger. I still remember standing there feeling disassociated and strange as I looked down on the eerie scene below us. Oh God in heaven, Ace whispered in the purple light of the cave. Before us, the bright red hand shot forward and grabbed the body of the headless man. It lifted the corpse up with ease. I watched the beast open its jaw wide enough to throw the corpse in without difficulty. Snapping its mouth shut, it sprayed more red down its face and across the eroded stone floor in front of it. Dark red stains emanated across the floor from 20 feet in front of the creature looking like clotted Rorkshire ink blocks in the fetid cave. We need to go deeper in, Jansen said, looking from me to Ace with a serious frown on her face. You insane, Ace said. Do you want to die? There could be thousands of those things down there. But the decision was quickly taken out of her hands as we heard screaming, a young, high-pitched voice. We all looked down at once and saw the white humanoid mutants dragging out a young boy, one that I recognized from pictures on the trailer park crime scene wall. He had cuts and scrapes all over him and was shivering, either from hypothermia or fear or both, but he was alive. His eyes were huge as he was dragged forward by his small hands towards the great red insectile beast in the corner. Dang it. I whispered, looking at Ace and Jansen. Okay, Jansen and I will take point positions. Ace, you guard the rear. We will form a triangle and start shooting. When one reloads, the other two cover. Ace, you'll need to swing back and periodically check our backs to make sure that there's no ambush. Now, let's go. They didn't question my command. Neither of them had time to. To save the boy, we needed to move immediately. We started down these smooth stone floors, only a couple of hundred feet away from unknown numbers of enemies. I fired first, aiming my shotgun at the group of mutants nearest to me as quickly as I could pull the trigger. 
The first shot blew the chest of one open. I kept going and hit another in the leg, and ended up blowing chips of stone from the wall behind them. I saw it all in slow motion, my adrenaline pumping and the heightened awareness of battle taking hold. The second shot hit the nearest one in the head. It exploded like a shattering vase. Bits of blood and bone flying out in all directions. I saw the one holding the boy drop his jance and hit it with a shot from the Ruger. It was an amazing shot, missing the boy entirely and taking off the head of the creature. It looked fairly risky, especially with the pistol, but I could tell that she had experience and marksmanship. And yet personally, I never would have tried from that distance with a hostage in tow with anything less than a rifle. The chance of blowing the hostage's head off seemed far too great. It made me wonder about her impulse control and risk taking mindset. Who was this woman after all? The white mutant continued holding the boy's hand for a second, standing on its feet as its mutilated half-destroyed head kept pumping sprays of red in the air. And then it fell, crumpling slowly to the floor. The black beast in the corner appeared enraged by this point. It gave off a banshee wail that sent out powerful blasts of sound, rising and falling in distinct waves. It sounded like a choked, much deeper version of a steam whistle. Instinctually, I wanted to drop my gun and cover my ears to stop the painful shrieking. It seemed even louder than the gunshots, something that I would have said was impossible before hearing it. And worse than all that, the beast was rising to its feet. While it looked fat and slow, and while I knew it to be full of eggs since we had seen it lay some, it turned out to be much faster than all of us would have expected. It had a huge, blood-red belly, but it moved with the grace and speed of a cat. It rose on its six legs, its upper body sticking up from the lower insectile carapace like some sort of demented centaur. Its branched legs skittered forward in a centipede-like motion that gave me an instinctive revulsion. But it wasn't running towards us. It was moving away from the gunfire towards a huge entrance. As it went, it grabbed the boy with its inhumanly long and thin arms. I feared that it would open its giant maw and pop him inside, and that would be the last that we would ever see of him. But it didn't. It disappeared, making that shrieking, a steam whistle cry as it went. My ears were ringing so badly from all the gunshots, the echoes of the gunshots and the cries of the beast that I was afraid that I had gone deaf for a moment. A stood in front of me, moving his lips, but I couldn't tell what he was saying. What? I screamed. My hearing slowly returned. We have to follow the boy, he said. We can't lose his trail. I knew that he was right. The existence of a live hostage had totally changed the situation. We had no backup coming and no way to call for help. We would have to take him ourselves. It seemed an insane proposition, and the creatures here vastly outnumbered us, but letting a hostage die was not an option. Yeah, no crap, I said gloomily. I sighed deeply. We had more ammo in the snowmobiles. I had filled my pockets with extra slugs, but I hadn't expected this. Ace was likely in a similar situation. We faced the choice of either going back and trying to grab as much ammo as we could, and possibly losing the hostage, or going forward and running the risk of using up all of our ammo, which was, after all, a risk either way, since we had no idea how many of those things lived in the tunnels. I saw the same thoughts running through Ace's mind as he looked back toward these snowmobiles and then forward to the tunnels. Let's go, I said, motioning for us to go forward. We can't risk losing the trail. We'll put breadcrumbs down as we go, metaphorically. Slice off tiny pieces of a jacket or something so that we can find our way back. Based on how many of those things I saw, he responded. I think we'll be able to just follow the empty shell casings alone. Jansen had already started running forward by this point, and we had to sprint to keep up. 
We ran past the eggs, some empty and others throbbing with inner life. I saw the one nearest to me pulsating with blood red veins, a thin, luminous skin revealing the silhouettes of a monstrous insectoid creature inside. It writhed and squirmed, twisting its six legs and pushing against the membrane that kept it entombed within the egg from time to time. Soon I knew that it would push through. How many others had already hatched? How long had this been going on? I had a feeling that we would soon find out. We sprinted into the tunnel, turning on our LED headlamps as we went. Jansen was in the lead in the ace, and then me at the rear. Periodically I checked our backs, but nothing seemed to be following us. Not yet, anyways. All the commotion was in front of us. That creature was still shrieking, though the sound was much more muffled and distant now. To my horror, I heard dozens of responses from all around, deeper in various tunnels that branched off from the main chamber or from this one. Some sounded very far away and barely audible, but others seemed much, much closer. I also heard the cries for help from the young boy, though these two grew fainter. We tried running faster, but what could a human's two legs do against that skittering monstrosity's six legs? Not much, I thought to myself. The tunnel looked empty. That strange mold grew everywhere here as well. We barely even needed the LEDs to see, though it had so many curves and branches that it was difficult to see far anyways. Every hundred feet or so another wall appeared, always curving to the left or to the right. As we ran, I saw glimmers of what looked like red eyes from some of these smaller side tunnels, but whenever I turned to look, they were gone. It was the same with those who might have followed us. I thought that I saw glimpses of a long white hand, or a lipless face for a moment, but when I pointed the gun, the thing had slunk back into the shadows or deeper into one of the endless branching tunnels that disappeared around corners in an instant. The shrieking of the beast had faded into the distance, and an eerie silence descended like a fog. We had all stopped by this point at an intersection of the cave system. One tunnel went off to the left at a right angle, the other to the right at a right angle, and then we had the larger main tunnel that we were following that extended in front of and behind us. Luckily, we hadn't yet deviated from the main tunnel, so... Finding our way back should be relatively easy. It felt substantially hotter down here as well. We had descended deeper into the chain of mountains that ran northwards, parallel to the Arctic Ocean. I had opened all of my jackets and taken off my hat but still felt boiling hot. I could tell that the other two did as well. Trickles of sweat beaded their faces and they were ripping off layers of clothing. They threw a couple jackets on the ground, not wanting to carry them for God knows how long. If we made it out of here, I thought that they might regret it. But after miles of walking, I too threw a couple jackets on the ground and left them. After all, when we came back this way to return to the snowmobile, we could just grab them again. Except, of course, we never did come back that way. God dang, A said. Well, we've lost the kid. Let's go back and report. We should be able to find a signal with the sat phone somewhere in the area. I wish that we had, but at that moment, circumstances beyond our control sealed our fate. It started with a small tremble, almost imperceptible. I looked around at the glowing purplish walls and the strange mossy molds that covered everything. Some of them lost connection with the walls as the shaking grew stronger. As soon as their root system stopped touching the stone and earth, the round cluster of detached mold would instantly go dark. Their black light illumination shut off like a switch when it stopped being anchored to the stone tunnel. Earthquake, I shouted, but Jansen and Ace clearly already knew. We looked around for someplace safe. We ducked into a side tunnel where the ground was more stable. Behind us, rocks smashed into the ground, knocked out of place after who knows how many years. It became a continuous cacophony. We ran faster and finally something behind us seemed to let go. 
the entire main tunnel sounded like it was collapsing. Some small pebbles and rocks dislodged and hit me in the face and chest as I ran, but it became increasingly clear that whatever fault line had slipped had been further back, running underneath the main northwards tunnel. It sounded like tons of dirt and stone had collapsed, and then as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. A few small aftershocks shook the area slightly, but as a whole it seemed like we were safe. We all had our LED headlamps on as we made our way back to the main tunnel, hoping that there was a way out. We had to get to the snowmobiles and more importantly, we needed help. There might be more people imprisoned or taken hostage down here for all I knew. Is everyone okay? I said. Fine, Jansen said, wiping dirt off her face. A small trickle of blood ran down her forehead. Jesus, the main tunnel, Ace said. Walking slowly out of the small tunnel that we had sought refuge in. Look at it. I came up behind him, unsurprised to see tons of rock spilling out towards us with smaller boulders and pebbles nearest, and huge pieces as tall as a man appearing further in. Um, we're going to need to find another way back, I said. We can't go back, Jansen said. There's a hostage in here. And how do you expect us to find him? Ace asked. These tunnels could go for a hundred miles in every direction for all we know. I felt another tremble below our feet as a small aftershock passed through the area sending a few smaller stones rolling and tumbling around us. But we had come this far after all. We're going to get that kid back, I said. We've already come this far and the way back is blocked anyways. We're going to need to find another way out. There has to be other entrances to this cave system. But what I really thought about was the horror stories that I had heard about the Paris catacombs. How occasionally somebody would find themselves lost in them. Countless random twists and turns through the darkness below the city, combined with many miles of tunnels meant that very few who found themselves alone and lost down there made it back. They often starved or died from dehydration, their bones inevitably mixing with the hundreds of thousands of others, resting eternally under the bustling cityscape above. After resting, we started moving forward together. Morale felt low and even Ace looked sullen and thoughtful. We continued on in the main tunnel, hoping that the boy still lived somewhere in these endless tunnels. But we hadn't heard a single sound from the creatures in so long that I began to give up hope. The tunnel ahead of us started to open up, and massive growths of the luminescent molds began infesting the floor and walls growing in shapes like ant mounds that reached nearly up to my neck. A soft sound began to echo back. It sounded like the babbling of a subterranean brook. Running forward, I shone the light into the stream and felt relieved to see that it was full of pure and clean water. I began to greedily shove handfuls of water into my mouth. I saw Ace and Jansen follow my lead. After all, the running and fighting... I felt hungry, thirsty, and tired. Looking up, I saw there was a primitive bridge against the stream, made of a slab of granite, and beyond I saw something that took my breath away. There was a cathedral down here, or at least something close to it. Hundreds of eggs stretched across the right and left sides of the chamber, like pews in a church. They were organized in lines with a ten-foot-wide empty path leading further in. Hundreds of feet above us, sharp stalactites hung from the ceiling, glowing in the purplish light of the mold who climbed the walls and thin streamers. At the end of the open chamber, a few hundred feet away, I saw a carving that stretched to the ceiling. Hewn from pure stone, it showed one of those insectile egg-laying monsters. It showed it standing up straight with its thin, branching arms stretched out to the ceiling above it. Its oval eyes wide and its huge mouth stretched open wide to show its countless predator's teeth. Below it, I saw one of the white humanoid creatures. This one wore a coarse brown robe, the first one of its kind that I had ever seen clothed. 
It was so still that I thought it was part of the carving at first, that they had created a religious icon showing these creatures serving their great and horrible masters. But then it turned toward us. We all raised our guns at once. Freeze, Jansen cried. I saw her finger tightened around the trigger. Don't, I said. It's unarmed. Wait. I felt eyes on me from all around me, but when I turned to check our backs, I saw nothing. We started walking forward towards the robed mutant. As we got closer to the front, I saw more and more of the eggs appeared empty. The ones in the back all had life inside. Life that pushed against the thin membranes and whose legs skittered eerily in the amniotic fluid that they breathed. Why should we let it live? Jansen objected angrily under her breath as we moved forward in unison. These things killed that family, and who knows how many others. When I think back to all the unsolved missing persons cases in this county, I knew what she meant. The same thought had occurred to me. How many people had these creatures killed? The mutant in the brown robe stood there, his lipless mouth forming a cold sneer as he looked me up and down. Its strange eyes seemed to bulge from its emaciated face. When I got close enough, I realized that they had almost an albino look to them, with blood-red irises that faded towards pink as they neared the center. The pupils seemed to glow, reflecting the eerie light of the mold. I didn't know what to do next. The creature in front of me spoke first, however. They are our gods, he croaked. From the depth of his voice and the cast of his body, I had figured out that this was probably a male among his species. The way he spoke reminded me of how deaf people sometimes sounded when they spoke. The words sounded strange with random pauses and changes in cadence, making it hard to understand at times, but it was definitely English. Who are you? I asked. What is this place? He shook his head, pointing to the huge carving behind him. Gods, he said. We feed, and they protect. Well, they haven't done a very good job so far. Ace whispered in my ear. Those huge bugs just ran screaming when we started shooting. I ignored this. What are you? I asked, hoping for an actual response. And this time I got one. We are the keepers. He said slowly, thoughtfully, looking up at the huge carving. And these are necrovores. He shook his head again, an expression crossing his face that looked very human. Was it regret, fear? And they're hungry, so hungry. As if on cue, I heard the skittering of many legs behind me. Spinning around quickly, I saw that while we had been distracted, some of what he called the necrovores had surrounded us in a semicircle, cutting off any retreat. They looked much smaller than the original one that we had seen, and I assumed that they were likely juveniles. Behind you, I screamed to my team, but they had already heard what I had. I raised my shotgun, firing a slug into the nearest one's curved red face. It went between its eyes and for a moment, I could see a clear hole all the way through behind it to the stone wall surrounding us. And then it crumbled, its legs shaking spasmodically in its death throes, its arms moving back and forth in small arcs quickly, as if it had a seizure in its last dying moments. Dozens of them appeared, and the speed at which they ran at us looked eerie. All I would see was a red blur and the flash of many branching legs, and an instant later, I would see one of those abominations flying through the air, with the jaws opened and claws raised forwards. The guns fired quickly, dropping a dozen in the space of a few seconds, and slowing the ones behind it enough for us to have a chance. But they skittered so fast, like huge spiders. Their many legs shuffled and cracked against the stone floors and they leapt at us. I dodged one, sidestepping it and shooting it in the head with a shotgun blast. Its dark red eyes looked at me from its angular face, 
as a giant exit wound exploded from the back of its mouth. Shrieking, it fell. Ace wasn't so lucky. One jumped at him, slashing with its sharp claws and unhinging its jaw. In a blur, I saw it grab his left arm, slicing through the cloth and skin easily. A spray of blood shot into the air. Ace, no! I screamed, chambering another round and firing. I hit the beast in the center of its body. It gurgled and spit his blood poured out of it. It tried to get up and keep fighting, but its legs gave out underneath it, and I watched it for a moment as it lay on the floor, kicking and dying. Ace had reloaded and turned, taking down another one with a direct shot. Jansen dropped the last two and then suddenly everything was quiet again. Only the ringing in my ears from all the gunfire broke it. I ran over to Ace, looking at his arm. He winced, pulling back his sleeve. I saw a deep gouge mark, the slice cutting nearly to the bone. Blood spurted out in time with his heartbeat, but it didn't look like any arteries had been severed. We quickly applied pressure in a tourniquet, and after many minutes of resting and attending to his wound, the bleeding had slowed. We sat among all the dead and necrovores. The strange priest had disappeared in the fighting, slinking away in one of the tunnels behind the carving. We need to find food and water, I said. There may be more underground streams if we're lucky but food. What are we going to do, cook a necrovore? I looked at the corpse of the nearest one disdainfully as I spoke. If we have to, Jensen said. I'm not dying down here, not unless I have to. That's funny, A said, looking at his injured arm. Because you were the one who acted all gung-ho to come down here in the first place. Even before we saw the boy, who by the way we have seen no sign of. This has all been a wild goose chase. An insane wild goose chase to God knows where. And probably death. Or the seventh circle of the nether, maybe. I said jokingly, but no one smiled. We continued walking. Eventually, we heard a soft babbling and found a small stream running through a side tunnel. We cleaned Ace's wound as best as we could, drinking as much of the clean, clear water as possible. But hunger began affecting me. I wonder if we really would have to try eating those strange red beasts if it came down to it. Maybe they would taste like lobster, I thought to myself with a smile. But our problems only got worse from there. Ace's wound looked terrible. Red inflamed patches of skin rose all around the slice and the veins seemed to be discolored as they led away from it. Oh, nothing to worry about. Ace smiled. It's only a flesh wound. But in fact, I did worry, and it got worse as we went on. After a couple more hours of walking, it started to really smell, and I saw pus and black spots beginning to spread on his arm. I had never seen an infection set in so rapidly and spread so quickly before. I wondered what kind of exotic alien bacteria might be on those creatures and I shuddered. We rested, finding an empty side of the tunnel and laying down. Ace and I were far away from Jansen who had wandered away down the tunnel a few hundred feet, maybe to use the bathroom in private. I don't trust her, Ace whispered. Yeah, neither do I. I think she knows more than she lets on. The whole thing seems weird, Ace said looking down at his arm for the hundredth time, frowning and wincing. But I think that you might find you need her. I'm certainly not in much of a condition to help you. After resting for a while, we got back up and started on down the tunnel again. The endless growth of mold still giving us enough illumination to see ahead without our headlamps. I tried to conserve the battery as much as possible. Ace quickly grew so sick that he staggered bending over and retching occasionally. Sweat poured down his forehead, and he swayed on his feet whenever he stood up straight. I looked at his wound and I gasped. I thought about the medical terms that I had heard. Separation, the wound discharging pus, draining the fluids of dying tissue and leaking it all over his skin. Necrosis, the living flesh being eaten as the man watches. None of these words covered the true horrors of what we saw. 
Ace walked for as long as he could, but as he went on, I could smell the wound more and more. Soon it became all that I could smell. It was nauseating like raw meat rotting on a wet summer day combined with a strange, fetid, bacterial odor. It drove me crazy and made me want to vomit. I couldn't imagine what Ace felt in those last dark hours. I had once seen a movie called Requiem for a Dream where the addict's arm had gotten infected. Streaks of black and purple spread across his skin, leading back to his heart. The central point of the infection rotting and spreading throughout the body as he watched it eat him alive. I had never seen anything like it, at least until this moment. Looking at the wound on his arm, the red inflamed veins bulging out, the black rotting skin in the center, the flesh separating and falling off. It tore at the limits of my sanity. I had to look away, but when I closed my eyes, I still saw it. And I always smelled it. I'm dying, he said. We'll get you help, I said, not believing it. He shook his head. I can't do this anymore. I can't take that smell. The smell of my body decaying. I can feel my skin separating. I can feel the pus running out. I can feel my body rotting from the inside. I can see it. He began to cry. Just go. Leave me with the shotgun and one slug. I'm not going on. I can't take it anymore. No, no. I started to say, but Jansen interrupted. He's right. He's dying, and even if we had medical attention at this point, I don't know if they could save him. The sepsis has spread him. The limbs need to be amputated. But we have no antibiotics and not even a single capsule of penicillin. He needs immediate, intravenous antibiotics to have any chance. Now leave me the gun, he said, and I did. I dropped the shotgun next to him, putting a lead slug carefully on the ground next to it. He laid down his face, pale and sweaty, his eyes wide and terrified. Now go, you shouldn't have to see this. You don't have to do this, I said, making one last feeble attempt to change his mind. But he shook his head. I'm not afraid to die, an old friend. I'm not afraid of doing it myself. I know some of those freaks say that it ruins your eternal soul or whatever, but I think we both know an infinite God if he exists. Probably doesn't give a crap. Every man owes a death after all, then we'll all get there somehow. But at least I took down a lot of those necrovores in the end. Maybe that'll be enough to give me entrance into Valhalla. Do you think? I felt a tear creeping down my cheek. Blinking quickly, I brushed the tears away. I think you'll have a front row seat in Valhalla Ace. Save me a seat. Take care. I said, knowing that he could do nothing of the sort. Turning sadly, we walked away. And as Jansen and I went down the tunnel, I heard a single shot of a shock and blast echoing from behind us. He's gone. I said slowly and sadly, the sound of the gunshot ringing through my head. Jansen shook her head as if clearing it. We need to get out of here, she said, or we'll be joining him. We have no food, no guaranteed access to water, no medical treatment. We'll probably starve. But if anything happens, we might die much faster. I sighed. My stomach churned and felt tight. I was so hungry that it hurt. A dull pain arose in my midsection, a constant reminder that I hadn't eaten a meal in far too long. Starvation, I knew, could take at least a few weeks especially if the person had some body fat and muscle before they began. And yet, with us walking dozens of miles beneath the earth in these caves, that optimistic projection of a few weeks until dying from starvation narrowed to significantly less. Just as bad and perhaps worse, I had run low on ammo. I felt in my pocket for more shotgun slugs. I counted 17 left. I would keep one for myself in case I were facing some horrible slow death and needed a way out. This meant that, when we were inevitably attacked, I only had 16 shots that I could fire. These problems circled around my head over and over as we walked. Jansen spoke little, 
Her breathing sounded heavy and her posture looked much more slumped than the gung-ho, straight-backed woman that I had first met. It looked to me like she was giving up hope. I tried to cheer her up. There must be dozens of exits in this place, I said. Think about it. Those white mutant humanoid things, the keepers. They're feeding those huge red bees which they call the necrovores, right? At least they're feeding them sometimes. I have a feeling that the necrovores could easily hunt for themselves. They're a clear apex predator. Perhaps the keepers just want to keep them secret though. I'll get to the point, Jensen said. What about the exits? We have seen exactly one exit and entrance to this place. Okay, I said. The keepers have to be bringing in meat from multiple openings. It wouldn't make sense for them to just have one opening, the one that we came in, and then walk hundreds of miles under the ground. They presumably try to feed the necrovores in this stretch of tunnel as well, so they must be going up and out, hunting or stealing food or whatever, bringing it back. So, you're saying that if we can find one and follow it, then maybe, Jensen began. But her words were cut off quickly as a shriek came from behind us. I spun, raising my already loaded gun and snapping the safety off. The sleek black Benelli shotgun felt like an extension of my body by this point. Until I ran out of bullets that was and it became just an inexpensive metal club. Jansen reacted as fast as myself, snapping on an LED light to give us more illumination. The white light shot out, blinding me for a moment. In comparison to the dull, purplish light of the fungus that grew on the sides and walls of the tunnels, it looked like the sun itself. A massive red blur disappeared down the hall from behind us, its eerie cry reminiscent of a steam whistle receding with it. I looked around for more signs that we were being followed and stalked, but it looked empty behind us. And we kept moving forwards in the main tunnel it ended, splitting into left and right corridors both the same size and without any indication of which one to take. By this point, I had given up any hope of seeing the kidnapped boy again. I wasn't even sure that I would survive. We went left and further up the tunnel split again. We went left again and eventually, I smelled something new. Roasty meat. My stomach immediately began to flip and ache as the scent wafted through the tunnel. I smell food, I said quietly, trying to keep the excitement out of my voice. Food, meat, oh thank god. We walked forward side by side, going faster by this point. Even Jansen's eyes gleamed. I'm so hungry. I could eat one of those necrovores, she said. I bet they taste like chicken. And they look more like lobsters, I said. Nice and red with a thick shell. I bet if you boiled them and got a little melted butter. Suddenly, I found the tunnel blocked by a necrovore. I instinctively jumped and raised my gun, almost firing straight into it. And then I saw that it had a bullet through the center of its chest. It looked dead, laying on its back with dark red eyes staring up at the ceiling. Its branching insectile legs curled up in a pathetic way, like a desiccated house spider. What the heck? Jansen asked, her expression twisting into confusion. Who shot this one? You? I shrugged. Well, it had to be one of us, I said. Perhaps the last time they attacked us, one of us hit one in the stomach and it ran off. Then once it got here, it finished dying from blood loss or organ failure, or whatever took it out in the end. That would be my guess. Jansen had knelt beside the corpse of the necrovore, moving one of its stiff legs aside to get closer to its open mouth, full of hundreds of sharp teeth. I saw her feeling around for something in her pocket. I have to use the bathroom, I lied, now curious as to what kind of scheme Jansen was up to. I had had a feeling ever since I first met her that there was something more to her being here than just a state cop wanting to tag along with rangers. I walked down the tunnel and when it began to curve, I pretended to move against the wall and start urinating, but I was watching Jansen. She reached into her inner coat pocket and took out a clear glass vial with a black top. 
Kneeling down in front of the necrovore, I saw her dip the vial in its mouth, presumably to collect some of its bloody saliva, and then screw on the top. I started walking back and she quickly tucked the vial back into her inner coat pocket. Jansen quickly backed up a couple steps from the necrovore, changing her facial expression into the pale and different look that she had worn for what felt like days now. But the real Jansen was under there. I had seen it and she was up to something. I debated bringing up what I had seen, confronting her directly, but I decided against it. I would confront her when the time was right. But for now, survival seemed more important. We left the neck revoir behind and began to go down the tunnel, towards the delicious smells of roasty meat that had grown much stronger now. Up ahead, I saw a ray of light shining into the cave. My heart soared. It was real sunlight, and that meant only one thing, an exit. I was going to run up ahead when I heard Jansen click the safety off her gun, cock the hammer, and tell me two words. Don't move. She was only a few feet behind me. I still had my shotgun strapped around my shoulder and I was looking forward, away from her. She had all the advantages. I knew that most likely I was doomed and I would die right here, on the floor of a cave without my family ever knowing what happened. Take your shotgun and drop it on the floor slowly, Jansen said. If you turn, I will shoot you. I did as she asked. Keep looking away from me. Now, I saw your expression when you first saw the necrovores at the entrances of the cave, and you didn't even look the slightest bit surprised. So I'm going to ask you one question and one question only. Have you seen them before? Yes, I said softly, remembering. About half a year before the events with Ace and Jansen in the cave, I had been alone in my log cabin. I made a full pot of coffee, cleaned and oiled my guns, and decided to go shooting. After pouring a huge thermos of boiling hot coffee, I grabbed my Winchester 3030, a beautiful gun with a polished walnut stock. I headed outside, setting up targets to shoot. I had gone to the dump and grabbed an old air conditioner and a metal trash lid, and I set these up at different distances. And because it was summer, the air smelled fresh and clean. The nighttime had come and with no pollution and no clouds, all the stars in the sky seemed to radiate a bright and pure light. It seemed as if blue flames shot out of my gun for a split second when I fired in the darkness. I would instantly hear the ping of metal as it connected with one of my targets. I had gone on this way for a while when the crying and shrieking had started from the woods nearby. No one lived near me so I instantly went on high alert. For a few seconds, I tried to convince myself that it was just a fox or a fish or cat, but I had heard both and it sounded different. This seemed much louder and almost synthetic. I reloaded my gun, stuffing an extra clip into my pocket and I began to follow the sounds. And then I heard a gunshot and then two, and the screaming grew louder. I sprinted ahead, dodging roots and rocks moving between the evergreen and birch trees growing thick in this part of the forest. The insects had mostly fallen silent after the gunshots, and the wilderness had an eerie, silent quality to it now, as if everything in these woods were staying quiet so that they could hear what happens next. And then I caught glimpses of them. Two men and a red insectile beast that stood over eight feet tall, the men looked panicked and certainly had no sharpshooting skills. They had emptied their clips from the look of it, but I only saw a couple small trails of blood on the insectoid creature, namely from shallow grooves that ran over the side of its chest and above one shoulder. It moved forward in a rage and used its razor-sharp fingers to slit the nearest man's throat, and then it moved on to the next man. I was running as fast as I could, trying to get within range to save the man's life. In horror, I watched the beast jerk its head forward, its mouth opening wide as its jaw disengaged, and it bit off the surviving man's legs at the knees. I screamed, no, and stopped running, looking through the sight and opening fire. 
I hit the red creature a few times in the head, right between its dark and staring eyes and after a few seconds of screaming it fell back. I ran forwards, going to the injured man and shaking him. What was that? I yelled at him. Who are you? What are you doing? He shook his head slowly as if trying to clear it and then he looked up at me. My name is Constantine, he said in a thick accent. I am an agent for the SFB, an agent for my home country of Russia. I would not normally tell you this, but I'm dying. That creature... He pointed at the huge red thing lying dead on the ground. It has a bacteria in its body that has immense potential as a biological warfare agent. It can cause septic shock in a human, and most antibiotics have no effect. A millionth of a drop of what that creature has could kill a man. And when the post-mortem is done, it will look just like a runaway bacterial infection, something that anybody could get. Thanks, I said, putting a bullet into his head. And then I buried the two agents and the red creature in a single mass grave. The soft Alaskan soil covered them all quickly. No one would have access to any biological weapons from these creatures while I was alive, not if I could help it. I told all of this to Jansen, if that was her real name, trying to kill as much time as possible. My only hope was for some deus ex machina, some sort of fortuitous savior who could stop her, because in my heart I knew that she would not let me live. No more than the Russian agents would have let me live if they had succeeded in killing the necrovore and knew that I had seen. Jansen went pale, her face turning into a deep skull, and then she added, So the Russians somehow heard about the necrovores, she said to herself. And now they want to take samples just like us. Who are you really with? I asked. I know you're not a cop. I'm CIA, she said smiling wide. I really do feel bad about this, but orders are orders. I was explicitly told that no witnesses could survive. The CIA wishes to take some necrovores alive and see if they can be used as biological weapons in themselves. If released in an enemy country, for instance. But for now, even just the extremely powerful bacterium is enough. Goodbye, and I'm sorry. I closed my eyes, breathing fast. My time was up. I knew that I would die now, shot in the back like a common criminal. But no shot came. Instead, I heard a surprised grunt of pain and then a horrible gurgling, a spitting sound had started. I turned my head slowly, wondering if this was some sort of trick, and then I saw it. Jansen stood with her throat cut, a fountain of blood pouring down the front of her clothes. Her eyes looked amazed and surprised, as if she had just seen the world's greatest magic trick. And then she fell, her body landing hard on the stone floor of the tunnel. Behind her, I saw Ace, his bloody folding knife held tightly in one trembling hand. His other hand looked black and dead, the fingers twisted strangely. Oh my god, Ace! I yelled in shock and bliss. I thought you were dead. Uh, soon, he said, falling himself on top of Jansen's body. I ran over to him, the smell of the rotting meat of his arm covering the entire area, but I was so happy that I could hug him. How? I asked Ace. He looked up at me, his eyes watering and unfocused, and then he vomited up a stream of watered down blood. It fell on the hand of Jansen. Uh, I was attacked, he said. Not one single slug. I had to use it to shoot a necrovore that tried to ambush me immediately after you guys left. And then someone started cooking and I smelled meat. I had made my way slowly in the direction of the smell, and I found one of the white mutants roasting a deer on fire. They had stores of food in one room. Mushrooms, ferns, meat, and nuts, and it was huge. I hid behind a pile of deer skins eating as much as I could, waiting to die and sipping some water that trickled down from the ceiling. And then I heard you and Jansen nearby. Your voices echoed and you scared away the white mutant, the keeper who was cooking. I heard Jansen's confession and I killed her. He pointed to his arm. 
The black and purple rod had spread past his shoulder and began to eat into his chest. I'm almost done. Almost done. Will you give me peace? Will you do the coup de grace? I nodded, putting a slug in the chamber. Ace looked up at me, his eyes tearing up, his face reflecting the sadness and uncertainty deep within him. I'll tell everyone of your bravery, old friend. I said, pointing the gun at his forehead and pulling the trigger. There was a splash and then I was alone. I took all the ammo and the guns off Jansen, which gave me 19 rounds for the Ruger. And then I began to walk towards the sunlight that I still saw streaming across the hallway praying for an exit. I turned into the room and saw what Ace had seen. A deer roasted over a dying fire. A pile of edible mushrooms on a deer skin in the corner. A pile of fiddleheads next to it and a variety of edible herbs from the forest on the other side. Some dried, jerky-like meat also lay on a huge, flat rock under the sun. I saw with horrifying disappointment that the light came from a small hole in the ceiling, one where the smoke from the fire could escape. There was no way to get up there unless I could transform into a spider and the hole seemed too small to crawl through anyway, but it still gave me hope. It meant that I was in thousands of feet below the ground and that a real exit might be right around the corner. If only there weren't so many branching caverns to get lost in, I thought. I ate well and then took a deer skin and began to wrap up as much food as I could carry. It was undoubtedly the best meal of my life. After starving in the darkness for so long, even the most tasteless food seemed like ambrosia. I tied the deer skin to a long stick, like a hobo going off to a train and balancing it on my shoulder went off of myself. I wandered for weeks, eating as little as I could from the food. I found another kitchen in which the keepers stored food on the second week, with elk meat and more dried mushrooms stored there, and I took what I could. Cold mountain streams flowed through the caves periodically, giving me water to drink, and yet I found no exit, and though I caught glimpses of white hands or red shells behind me, the enemy seemed happy to simply stalk me and watch, until I neared the end that was. It came suddenly, a huge archway up ahead past a bend in the cavern. Because it was night, I didn't even realize at first what I saw, but the light of the moon looked so different from the dull and purplish light of the mold that I realized with ecstasy that I must be close to the end of this eternal cave. I started to run and that was when the ambush was sprung. They came from everywhere. Keepers in coarse brown robes and flashes of red from the necrovores surrounding me. The necrovores spat and hissed while the keepers rambled in their strange, high-pitched, yammering language. I dropped my remaining food on the ground, seeing it spill on the floor in slow motion as my adrenaline spiked, then in a blur. I had the Ruger 454 in my hand. I ran toward the door, emptying all six rounds at those necrovores closest to me. I aimed for their dark red eyes, a technique which had worked well in previous battles. I tried to clog the tunnel with the corpses of those nearest, but the smaller ones behind writhed and wriggled past the twisted, bleeding bodies of their siblings. I was almost to an exit, however. I could feel the fresh air by this point. I felt hands grabbing at me from behind, grabbing the Ruger. I began to pistol whip anything and everything near, eventually feeling the hands release after a couple of seconds. One of them grabbed at the pistol and it fell to the floor. I had no time to pick it up. Now I had necrovores on each side of me, and they moved in a blur, their legs skittering forwards as their bodies twisted from side to side in hungry anticipation. Their mouths opened wide and their claws began to whip through the air as I grabbed the shotgun opening fire. The first one I blew off its hand, it shrieked looking down as blood pumped out of the stump, and then began to backpedal, knocking the necrovore behind it down. The second one jumped straight at me, its huge maw opened wide. 
I could see down its sleek wet throat. It aimed at my face and I began to shoot blindly, hitting its open mouth three or four times. It fell to the floor a few inches from me, and I heard a click as the shotgun ran out of ammo. As I ran, I put my last bullets in the shotgun. Shooting behind me and hitting a couple of those who would kill me, I felt in my pocket and realized that I was now down to two bullets. I sprinted through the exit, grabbing for the very last rounds. I saw those creatures coming through the stone door and after slamming a slug in the chamber, dropped a large necrovore at the threshold. It fell noiselessly, blocking the door to those behind him and I ran. I ran for what felt like hours, until I saw a small curl of smoke up ahead. I found a small Eskimo village on the coastline. An elderly woman in a little shack opened the door. Somebody in the town had a ham radio, which they used to call for help and get me evacuated. When I first got back and saw myself in the mirror, I was horrified. I had lost many pounds and looked thin and frail, my cheekbones sharp and angular. My haunted eyes sunken deep into my skeletal face. I could count every rib on my chest and my legs looked like sticks covered in skin. I didn't tell my boss the whole story or anyone else for that matter. I had been missing for weeks and mostly said that I got lost in the tunnels when looking for a missing boy, which was true to an extent. I did not tell them about the necrovores, however, or the brave actions of Ace that saved my life. That was a story I kept to myself. Until now.